everybody, welcome to a new episode of the Min Max Show, a place about games, friends, getting better. My name is Ben Hansen, thank you for being here. I'm joined by Leo Vader. Hello, thank you for being here. Hello. Does ever thank you for being here? No one ever has. I've wow. read every YouTube comment ever submitted on uh, Min Max's <laughs> YouTube channel. Not one! Not I'm one! Uh, we're wow. joined by Kyle Hillier, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, Ben. Oh my god! Uh, we're joined by Jacob How's Geller. That feel? Is that good? It's alright. It's alright. Uh, Jacob Geller. Hello, uh, you're welcome for being here. Hell yeah. yeah. Joined by Jana Garcia. Hello, thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you all for being here. Uh, appreciate I like your everybody. Shirt. Wait, Jana, I like your shirt. Hell. This is such a wholesome episode. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, it needs to be, because there's a lot to unpack in this episode. Uh, we're talking about what will win game of the year. Not ours. That's going to be top secret until we get into the 210s debate, which is going to be our big game of the year discussion that we air in full. Uh, but this is for the Game Awards. They announced their nominations, so we'll be going through just the game of the year stuff there. Then we're going to be talking about Like a Dragon Gaiden, colon, the man who erased his name, and the man who erased his name's original name was Kiryu? Um, is the full don't name of that anyone. title? Okay. Uh, you? Who's Kiryu? I don't know who that is. It's not important. Uh, we're also going to be talking about Super Mario RPG. We're going to be talking about Thirsty Suitors, some other odds and ends. And then back half of the show, we have some wonderful guests from Aftermath, the new site uh, joining us. We have Gita Jackson and Nathan Grayson. They're going to be joining us to help answer some community questions that you all submitted over there on Patreon. Um, does anybody remember last week's episode of the podcast? Like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were debating whether or not 2023 was the greatest year ever right. for games, right? And uh, I felt like the majority of people were like, it's a great year, but greatest year ever, I don't know. I, I then did a Twitter poll on MinMax's uh, Twitter account just asking, hey, is 2023 the greatest year ever for gaming? And uh, yes, I think so, is at 55%. Like... Nice. Undoubtedly, it seems the community was like, yeah, of course it's the greatest year for gaming. Well, we're in 55% the of it. is undoubtedly? Well, 55%. <laughs> and then uh, 21% was nope. It's obviously this year instead. And then, to be fair, 24% of people said, I don't care. Um, so <laughs> what is the difference? The real okay, so uh, I see how you get undoubtedly from that. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly undoubtedly. But is it just, uh, yeah. you think it's a reason? No, I'm not ready to sort of put my stamp on it, but I think it's certainly up for debate and discussion. The year's not over yet either, you know? I, I listened to last week's segment. I was surprised we had statistics to back it up, like most games over 90 on Metacritic ever. Right, right. right. But then even that gets misleading. People like, are getting real flippant with those tens this year, everybody. Come on. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm just saying, GameSpot's either giving out fives or tens for, I think, every <laughs> single game released in 2023. Everyone's uh, around. Um, yeah, speaking of which, what do you guys think about those Modern Warfare 3 reviews? I haven't played the game. Jacob, I know how you feel about Call of Duty at this point. There's a part of me that sees that game getting like fours and fives, and it's like, come on. Like, I'm not going to play it. I'm not excited about it. I understand it's disappointing, but like fours and fives. Then again, I guess that's the review score thing. Like if you truly were that unenthusiastic while playing it, maybe it deserves that. Let's do the comment. What commenters seem to all discuss, which is not play it, but get mad about the scores. <laughs> Yeah. Everyone can play at like. home. See what the hype is about that. Yeah, yeah, jump in the chat. It's fun. I love. I love that being able to shoot a gun does not automatically get you five points. Which I feel like is the you know. It's like for a while, I think Call of Duty review scores were like technically it's so solid that like how could you give it below this? And I I like that it's like that doesn't count anymore. We've right, seen right, you right. do this for fifteen years in a row. Your campaign like truly sucks. It doesn't matter that like feel shooting a gun feels good. Mm. Yeah, I guess I guess that's fair. It, I don't know. I mean, review scores they're they're tough for you, but that would always just stood out to me where it's like you look at some other first person shooters that are getting fours and fives out there. Uh, it's uh, Battleship the video game. You know, it's like just real like sub tier stuff. But you know what? That's did you also haven't played? Hey, not yet. Stay tuned, Not everybody. <laughs> new show plus. Uh, stay tuned. Yeah, for... new show plus. You play a bunch of FPSs that scored under like <laughs> uh, under five. I think uh, Nerf Legends idea. gets on there. I think right? that's a good idea. Put it on the list. Uh, all right, but for uh, the Game Awards, the Game of the Year nominations uh, overall, Baldur's Gate three and Alan Wake two. Uh, tied for overall nominations this year. They each got eight. Spider-Man 2 got a total of seven. Mario Wonder got six. Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom got five. And Resident Evil 4 got four. Uh, but for the big game of the year category, six nominees, according to the Jeff 
Keeley pool, which I guess we can now uh, declare that we we helped submit some things. Uh, we are in that uh, jury here at MinMax, so we're able to submit our nominations that then goes into the big hive mind, huge pool of everybody else submitting a bunch of nominations for all these things. Uh, but according to the Game Awards and everybody's vote so far, the nominees for the Game of the Year are Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate 3, hold for applause, Marvel Spider-Man 2, Resident Evil 4, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, and Tears of the Kingdom. All Hi sequels. I didn't really hear that until right now. Ooh. Yeah, really, really I was well. thinking of that too when I saw it, but I mean, that's kind of always... Yeah, it is. That's <laughs> almost always the case. Like, I can't think of a of a time that wasn't. I'm sure there has been, but... Yeah. yeah. Maybe, if Control here. got nominated? Control is definitely that, nominated. That yeah, there's there's plenty of stuff. Stranding that, was nominated, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it yeah, gets in yeah. there. There's, there's I guess couple. it does... Yeah. yeah it's... It is interesting, though. I did notice that as well, Leo, where it's like, oh, yeah, like, these are all sequel games. I mean, that, it's, it's the weird way that the video game award circuit works, where it's like the the best picture Oscars are not the also the most popular franchises uh, of movies right. that exist. But that is the case for games and the most popular franchises get a bunch of sequels. Yeah, it's interesting. Sent the Prophet in the community submitted this question just saying, if you told me in 2005 that the 2023 Game of the Year nominees would be Resident Evil 4 and a 2D Mario game, I would assume that technological innovation has stopped in the game industry. <laughs> it's like two great games, but, you know, you know, it's interesting take of like, oh, should the year 2023, should the, uh, these all be VR games? Massively multiplayer cloud based gaming and stuff like well, genres then you'd, we've you'd never show heard them of. Alan Wake 2 and their brain would explode <laughs> out the back of their head. <laughs> yeah, you hadn't finished that last time we talked about it, Jacob. Uh, and you're like, I don't know if they're gonna stick the landing without spoiling anything, obviously, because we're still going through for the deepest dive. Uh, how are you feeling about uh, the conclusion uh, of landing it? stuck? Ooh, uh, nice. <laughs> what I'll say. Okay, all right, you really loved it overall. Oh, yeah. Um, so what do we think is going to win? Not for us, but for overall Game of the Year stuff for the Game Awards. If you had to pool everybody together. I'd, I'd be shocked if anything but Baldur's Gate 3 won. That's, that's got the critic mass support and the player mass support. People go nuts for that game. and the Including me. I go gaga for that game and I'm a you defender know, but of I it. I saw in your, in your survey you put minus one Baldur's Gate 3 for your vote. <laughs> Maybe this will work, Keely. The one, the one thing that would hold it back, I wonder, is the folks voting if, if they haven't played it, right? Like, I feel like yes, yes, that's people, that's me. people who played it love it, and then there's everyone else. But it's <laughs> which like is the larger number in in our two tens debate when uh you know when Sarah and Haley and everyone start arguing for Baldur's Gate three as the game of the year. I'm not going to be like, no, it isn't right. Like, I yes. even have, having not played more than like an hour of that game. I think they're probably right. <laughs> totally. <sighs> yeah. I, 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 you know, we've talked about it a little bit, but with the two tens, it gave me there to be like, I think something that we can factor in maybe a little bit more heavily this year is that idea of like, cause I think in the past it's like, you know, maybe I'm thinking of Forza Horizon 5 and how I'm still burning about that idea of it not being on the two tens. But I think it was like, oh, a couple people tried it and they're like, I don't really like it. And I feel like that kind of tanked it a little bit. And I think the most fair way to go about that is like, if it should factor in as dragging it down in the two tens if you were disappointed by the game. You know what I mean? If you had expectations and you feel like this is my genre, this is my type of thing, and now it's dragging down. Whereas stuff like Baldur's yeah. Gate 3. Like, even if it's not clicking with some of us, it's not like I went into that and I'm like, God, this really let me down in some way, you know, because it's clearly awesome. Yeah, I mean, that was my whole thing with it. It's like, mm. I look at that game. And I'm like, hey, yeah, I don't think that's going to be for me. It's not my genre. And then I played it for like two hours and I was like, yeah, that's not really for me. It's not my genre. <laughs> like, it right. perfectly <laughs> met my expectations of not being a Kyle game. But it's a bummer uh, then so if like that and your experience with the game drags down enthusiasm for people like, yeah, Janet and Haley and Sarah that really love it. But that's that's a tough call because I I totally think it's a fair way to look at it. I also think it's like not notable that I didn't like that game. It would be notable if I liked it because it's so different from mm -hmm. games I've liked in the past. But me not liking about it, I haven't felt the need to like talk about that that much because like that's not yeah, a story at that point. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Kyle, I'm curious about your read since you love Zelda so much on just like the enthusiasm like that felt like such a lock for such a long time in the industry and I feel like just things have shifted quietly where now I'm looking around and I feel like I'm in a Gerudo desert just looking around being like yeah. wait you all don't <laughs> think Tears of the Kingdom is the best game this year I what mean, is happening to be clear like 
that's I probably don't even need to say it out loud, but that's where I am. Sure, like, sure. I don't think it's <gasps> even a competition, but wow. I do think it's like a product of the student that has turned in a pluses their whole uh, educational career. Call of and Duty. And then this new student showed up with and people are like, who's this person? And they also turned in an A plus and they're like, whoa, who's this person? Even though <laughs> this person yeah. also does A plus work. You know, Zelda's kind <laughs> of a, a victim of its own uh, previous success to a certain degree, though, man, like. Yeah, I, I I could certainly make arguments about Ultra Hand, uh, and it's hey, sort of look, I, that I would we imagine save... we're gonna have that debate in a bit. Yeah, way. but I mean, I do think I think Leo's right. I I do think I think Game Awards will. I think I think Baldur's Gate will probably take it, and I bet Alan Wake Two is gonna sweep all the other sort of awards. Yeah, yep. yeah. I think uh, I yeah I I am so sure. Well, you know, I can be wrong, but like. Alan Wake 2 seems like such a lock for direction because yes, it's like yes. the the exciting thing about that game is that it has direction, you know, and I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking at, you know, and and no offense to these games, games like Spider-Man 2 and Super Mario Bros. Wonder, you don't play those games and you're like, I feel the hand of a director. And I mean, like Sam, like literally put himself in the game. So maybe it's like cheating, but like, you know, it, it, it feels it, it's almost the same as like, you know, a, a Kojima game or whatever, where it's like, you yep. know who made decisions yes. and that matters. Yep. Yeah. It's almost like the best editing Oscar going to Bohemian Rhapsody. It's like good editing goes unnoticed, but it's the most editing will get our attention and make yeah. us think about it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also the, the and Ellen Wake and Bohemian Rhapsody equal quality. Yeah. Oh. Next I mean, the, the wonder, the wonderful thing, too, about Tears of the Kingdom and Baldur's Gate is the fact that it feels like there is no director, right? Like that's that's what's cool about those games right that's like interesting the player is the one directing what's happening and alan wake is like the opposite where it's like no no no, we are putting you in a uh theme park ride and uh, have a great time <laughs> you know janet look Spider-Man this way now look park. that way then you know well, alan wake too a big amusement park year overall i think for the game of the year stuff there's two in there uh, janet if you uh, if you're a gambling woman uh where would you put your money for game of the year for the game awards here Oh yeah, definitely Baldur's Gate three. Definitely. I also would be surprised um, if it lost. I think if it lost to anybody, it would be to the Kingdom or Hot Take Alan Wake two. Just because I think Alan Wake two has that. It's highly beloved in like critic circles and game awards. Is almost primarily like critic voted. There is a public vote that does it's have a ten percent. Yeah, oh, yeah, it does. but it's okay. very small. Sure I, like I don't think it's enough to sway it to the what the fans generally think. Um, yeah, I think Baldur's Gate 3, it's beloved. It has that thing where, despite being very beloved, it it, it feels like an underdog story, even though it's not, yeah, which right. like, yeah. was Elden Ring last year as well, where Elden Ring hits a lot of those boxes of, if you didn't like it, you probably like know that you just didn't like it because you don't like it, versus didn't think it was good. Yeah. Um, it's sort of hitting like a niche lane in a way, but it's it's niche enough where you feel kind of cool picking it, but obviously it's very popular, so it's not actually like that. So it, I think it fits that really well, and I agree with Kyle. I think Tears of the Kingdom is a victim of its own success, specifically in <sighs> its direct following of Breath of the Wild, where people will debate which one they like more, even though I think Tears of the Kingdom is like a better game, but they're like, yeah, but Breath of the Wild, it felt fresh, it felt different, it was exciting. It, and here it's like, people were excited, but I think Baldur's Gate 3 is just so much easier to get more excited about, and that's why I think it would win. Yeah, yeah. We did a, a, a Twitter poll again, uh, saying, "Hey, based on the Game Awards nominations, what's winning Game of the Year?" And they only allow four slots, so I kicked the Mario Wonder and Resident Evil Four remake. I know to the curb. you're adding to the that we're an anti Mario <laughs> Wonder outlet. I was gonna reply, but then I'm like, no, let me just keep this toxic thought to myself. Yeah, because Janet, just to be clear, you've been playing a lot more Mario Wonder, and you're getting hotter and hotter. And Jeff beat it, and I know he's hotter and hotter. I mean, I would. I'm I'm enjoying my time. Okay. I don't know how how heated I am. <laughs> Janet, I'm, Janet, I'm, I'm Janet, for the love of God and YouTube comments, can you just say it's the second coming of Christ, please? <laughs> Never. Damn I it. would rather be destitute. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, like I I'm excited to continue talking about that game, um, especially you know hearing that as more people progress through it, I think there's definitely conversations to be had about some of the other design things in the world things yes, um but yes. i did think it was funny <laughs> that's the only one you didn't put on there well like, resident evil yeah, 4 you had to but like when you had to knock one down i mean frankly i do think it that in resident evil 4 i think are the kind of i don't know less 
the, interesting of the ones I think in, so. in the pile. I think a so bit? too. Resident Evil Four has has so many diehards and would have a chance. Honestly, though, Alan Wake Two, I feel like is going to split the vote. Ooh, mm, that's a great yeah. point. Yeah, yep, and they give it for something new and novel. Um, yeah, yeah, similar games, similar fans. So, so the yeah, Twitter I mean, poll. Alan Wake is also just like it's the most recent game most people play before submitting that ballot. Yeah, you yeah. know, if Resident Evil Four came out in October. That probably would have been higher on my picks, but like I had just played Alan Wake and was buzzing. Yeah, and it's it's tough, right, to try and remember all the games that came out the year. It's nice to see Hi-Fi Rush getting as much love as it did for a January release, but it's interesting that like, you know, if your game releases in December, it can still be up for the Game Awards the following year, but like, you know, Marvel's Midnight Suns is nowhere to be seen in like the best strategy category this year. It's like, yeah, just people don't think of it, you know? It's just sad. But um, for the Twitter poll for uh, what's winning game of the year, uh... Coming in last place, according to the Min-Max community, Marvel Spider-Man 2, mm. only 3.3%. Uh, Alan Wake 2, 10.7%. Then Tears oh. of the Kingdoms at 28%. And yeah, 58% of people voted for Baldur's Gate 3 predicting the yeah. game of the year. I was shocked. I, again, no no slander to the to the great Baldur's Gate 3, but like... Never. I just feel like I missed a sea change in a huge way. Like, I thought it'd at least be... A- yeah, you had a kid. Oh, is that what happened? <laughs> that was your Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> the entire time I was out, everyone's just like, wait a minute. Obviously, this is Cody. Uh, but hey, yeah, we'll be uh, reacting live to the Game Awards on December 7th from the Midmax Studio. Um, and then Janet will be in there. Um, yeah. Not charging the stage. Correct. Perfect. Just the way we like it. Uh, that'll be fun. Just you looking forward to that, Janet? In my seat. <laughs> is that the, are you looking forward to that experience is there anything that you're especially pumped about for for going to the game awards again this year yeah i mean i just i just love going like it's it's fun to get to attend it's fun to dress up for it it's fun to see everybody in the industry i guess the number one thing i'm looking forward to is seeing people from yeah. the industry come out for it and i feel like i don't know if there's more and more people that like show up for it or if it's just as my circle of people I know in the industry continues to grow, I feel like there's more people there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I had a, it was definitely like a talking point, like as I went to conventions about like, oh, do you think you're going to make it out for Game Awards? Like, I think there's definitely a sector of our industry community that's like, this seems like a fun excuse for us to kind of all get together. Yeah. Sort of regardless. And I, I like that aspect of it. Um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to everyone being in town and, and hanging out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. Part of me is like, uh, should I try and go? But I just, you I, should, I mean, I I, it. like, it would be, I mean, it'd be really cool if you went. Like, I would I love think to be fun. have us both attend. Like, I think it'd be so fun. I think it'd be fun too, but it's a matter of babies and also, I really yeah, like reacting live. There's, there's other years. Yeah, we, I got GDC. That's for the nerds to get together and, I don't know, drink beer and talk about games. Uh, but hey, uh, speaking of drinking beer, I assume it's in the game because everything else is uh, Like a Dragon got in, the man who erased his name, the new Yakuza slash Like a Dragon game. Uh, who's all been playing this sucker? Leo. Oh, Leo, Jacob. Kyle, and Jacob. Awesome. This is the game that is bridging the world between uh, Yakuza 6 and Yakuza 7 uh, and setting up where we're going to be going with Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, which comes out in the end of January. Is that right? I yeah, think, it's think, early. Yeah. And they also had that headline recently about like, it's freaking huge. It's always a little bit scary to hear, but that's just for us in our line of work, I guess. But like, the pitch for Like a Dragon Gaiden is it's pretty small and understandable and containable. And then Infinite Wealth, you're already getting out there being like, it's infinite hours long, everybody. So get ready for the next adventure with Ichiban. But uh, Jacob, what do you think of Like a Dragon Gaiden so far? So I beat it last oh, whoa. night. Whoa, whoa, okay. Uh, and it it rules. I am, I am quite hot on it. Quite hot. Okay, so this, uh, how long to beat has it at like 10 hours from the main story and 30 hours if you're a completionist? Do you have a sense of? It was, uh, it was 13 for me. And I don't feel like I, I don't, I don't feel like I mainlined it, but, um, there are, I think that number comes from, there are a couple things that you can sink a lot of hours into if you want to get good at like pocket circuit racing or like do all of the fights in the arena, but like, I I feel like I got a pretty good picture of that game and the activities, and I was done in 13 hours. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then Leo and Kyle, how much have you guys played? I think like four to four four to six hours, something like that. I I my I I was telling Jacob I left it on pause for like a really long time, <laughs> like as I was cooking dinner. So I think I, I think I'm like closer to four probably. Uh, I've only played like an hour. I I'm not totally sold on it yet. I want to hear more about it from our panel. 
Yeah, what's I, I used to really love the brawling ones to the point where the t- it going turn based. I was like, they can't do that. The brawling is so classic. But now going back to it, it's like I don't know if I'm in the mood for this right now. Mm. The brawling isn't quite feeling snappy. It's feeling a little stiff. And the new uh, spider gadget where you throw out a a lasso that grapples an enemy and then you throw them left or right. That looks so weird. <laughs> you throw them to the right and they just disappear off screen. They go f- 100 feet, which is like, I'm not opposed to that at all. But they, it's, there's no animation. They disappear. Does yeah. it feel stiffer? It's so than, weird. Does it feel stiffer than like Ishan that you played earlier this year? Um, n- Not necessarily, but I feel like I was sold on that a little bit more from the like samurai nature of it. The okay. I, kind of. I think it does Am actually feel significantly different than Ishin. One, because uh, you don't have a sword, and I honestly just think swords do a lot in terms of video game combat because it means you have a much longer range. You know, it's like fists, you really have to be right up there, and so, like, targeting issues get worse. And the interesting thing going from uh, uh, Ishin to this is you only have two stances. So you have his kind of secret agent stance, where you have this like watch lasso and you get other gadgets that you can use. And then you have his Yakuza stance, which is just like brawling. And it is it gets better throughout the game. But like, I do think of the three Yakuza games I've played this year, which is crazy because that's like (laughs) 200 hours. It's probably like the weakest uh, combat of the three. And yet I still came out really, really liking it. How essential do you feel like it is? Um, is it just mainly for like fans of old Yakuza, uh, or if like, if, you know, I'm mainly selfishly thinking of myself, you know, where I dabbled in Yakuza before, never really clicked. And then I loved like a dragon so much. And I, I feel like I just want to focus on each amount as much as possible and kind of move things forward. And then this thing comes out and it's like, well, it's short, that's tempting. But then again, it's like, there's so much Kiryu lore to get caught up on. So how, how much pressure should I feel to play this thing? Well, so this is this is the first Kiryu starring game that I've played. Oh, um, interesting. I have okay. not played zero through six. Um, oh, and we're what, in the same boat. That's cool. Yeah. So what I would say is that actually this is really good for someone like you, which is essentially also me in that, like, <laughs> I feel like I I feel like I get Kiryu now in in a way that it was done pretty where it's like I, I absolutely do not understand all of the trials and tribulations that he's been through. But I think one of this game's strengths is like how how it works with his characterization and specifically. And it's like I, it sucks that I, I can't talk about this, but it's like the ending to this game is so phenomenal that it Ooh. bumped it up like two points for me, you know, like <laughs> that, that it like it is it ends really, really well. And in that ending, I was like, I fully, I get Kiryu, I understand him as a character, I understand what's cool about him, and now, like, I am very excited for him and Ichiban to kind of, like, share the spotlight in uh, Infinite Wealth. Right. Okay, so what was uh, making you fall in love with the game before the ending, then? What was really standing out to you? It's, It's the typical, you know, Yakuza game stuff in that, like, these games are really they're really well directed kind of in just like a cinematic way like the cutscenes look great the, the the graphics are really really good and because it's short like you don't have as many of the cheapest kind of conversation you know like they're the the conversations where they're not even speaking and it's just like text boxes right, right. that are kind of uh, are mostly the side quests and basically everything in the main plot line is like a fully blocked and voice acted um, cutscene, and all of those just look really good um, and I, I, I just think that like the story is concise enough that like it it's mostly fun stuff and and towards the end it really gets good and uh, like I don't think it's a spoiler to say like it is happening concurrently to yakuza 7 okay so like there are events that you know about from yakuza 7 that you are now going to see from kiryu's point of view which is really interesting you really turned me around on this thing like i i think at the start of the year i'm like okay i i will play that for sure and then i think maybe with ishin the fact that i kind of fell off quickly from that one i'm like you know what i'm just gonna save up all my yakuza love for 
uh, infinite wealth and just come in guns blazing with enthusiasm. But now it's like, maybe I will make time for this thing. Yeah, it's it's 12 hours. Like, yeah. it's, it's not that big of an investment. Yeah, that's tempting. Leo, there's you like know, 30 other games that are 12 hours. That's so the like, part that really it. gets that's, you. That's where I'm at, Ben, where I'm like, I'm just going to, it's on my list, but... I'd rather put that time into a few other titles for a while. And that's totally on just my backlog and not on the game. But I do think there's so many of these titles coming out. I just feel like I can't commit to playing all of them. So I I too, I'm just holding it all for infinite wealth. But then I have to go like really ham on infinite wealth to make it feel worth it for what I've done to myself. So hopefully (laughs) I don't have not full of regret. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I found Yakuza games come out a little too often for me to play them on their terms. I find it's a lot better when I wait until I'm really in the mood for it and then go and do it. That's what I did with Seven, and I adore that game. And this yeah. one I just might not be ready for at this moment. I'm also, it's a little pet peeve of mine to give somebody their swan song and then put them in yes, four more games. That's... It's like, you've really got to show me why this has to be him. And I don't, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm still early. I, I feel a little... I don't know, pissy is the right word, but I just, I, I'm kicking the wall saying, Sega, what are you doing? Don't blow this! Because Yakuza Like a Dragon was so good, and it was such a good entry point for so many folks to get into the series finally, and I feel like then being like, alright, turn-based, new protagonist, here we go, it's called Like a Dragon now, here we go! Okay, well now it's called Like a Dragon, and now also there's going to be a, a one that's called Ishin that's kind of time-traveling, and this one's kind of brawler-based, and it's a remake of this old game. Okay, now there's this other one that's also brawler-based, and it's starring a character that you don't really know that well, but you will need to know them for the sequel to Like a Dragon, and so it's just it just feels like they kind of took some of the wind out of their let's bring on all the new people sales, you know? Yeah. But, then again, if it's off, good, though, yeah, you know? what do we know? What the hell do yeah. we know? Uh, plus, you gotta get ready for Infinite Wealth because, you know, in the last, what, I think it was like that Xbox uh, Direct video where they showed off that there's basically just like an Animal Crossing island baked <laughs> into Infinite Wealth and you can go build that up and bring people there. It looks so damn good. Um, we we do have to talk about something that happens even within the first hours that sure. is just like so funny and it continues throughout the game, which is, this game is called uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden, colon, The Man Who Erased His Name and the whole concept is Kiryu has gone into hiding he has he has erased his identity he is no longer the dragon of Dojima no he one's gonna know who he is now yeah mm. every single person in the game knows he is Kiryu immediately <laughs> <laughs> and and it is the funniest bit to have people be like this is who you are. Here's your life story. Here's how you got to this point. And he's like, an interesting story, if that was me. But it's not. <laughs> he, just, like, he just denies it the whole game, and everyone knows who he is. <laughs> That's amazing. That's, yeah, from the start, I was like, I need a reason why he's being so uncareful after everything he's done. <laughs> Leo, he's got glasses on. He's good, man. He's Superman. <laughs> he didn't even shave his stupid fucking <laughs> chin strap. <laughs> <laughs> that guy does sound hot. Unfortunately, I just I'm not associated with him in any way, but he sounds really cool and strong. Even in secretive conversations where someone will be like, "Okay, let's Okay, let's just clear the air. I know you're cure you. Here's what I need you to do for me. I'm going to make your life better." Even then, he will still be like, "Who's that? I'm Joryu." Like <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh okay, like a dragon got in. I mean, you mentioned the comment, but overall, you like this more than Ishin? Dragon? I, I do like it more than Ishin, Ooh. and it is specifically because, uh, one, Ishin was long enough that I kind of lost track of the story at some point, and two, like, I think Ishin ends story-wise pretty poorly, left sure. a pretty bad taste in my mouth, and this game, like I said, just, mm, chef's kiss ending. Oh, there we go. Uh, like a Dragon got in, everybody. Uh, it's only 50 bucks. Uh, Shorter experience, curious to see what everybody else thinks about and, it. And Game Pass as well, right? Always nice to call yep. it out. Oh, nice. There we go. Yeah. Uh, also on Game Pass, Super Mario RPG, the remake <laughs> exclusive to the Nintendo Switch. Uh, Kyle, you've been playing this thing. Yeah, I was just that would be funny if this was the one that Nintendo was like, you know what? Let's bring it to another platform. <laughs> what do we got to lose? Why not? Uh, uh, yeah. You beat this thing. Yes, yeah, I, I beat it and did some of the the sort of extra bosses, but not not all of them. Um, yeah, okay. I, I like this game a lot. I'm, I'm a big fan of the original. To be clear, like. It was the game that made me understand why turn-based RPGs are cool. Mm. Like, I really didn't get it up to that point. I remember I would go to a friend's house. Maybe you guys had this experience, too. And you'd go through all their Super Nintendo cartridges. 
and you'd be like, oh yeah, this is you 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 press a button and a sword sing, swings. You press a button and you jump. And then I would pop in like Final Fantasy and be like, what is this? I'm like selecting from menus. I just suddenly get attacked. Like I just truly did not get it for yeah. many years. Um, and then I played Mario RPG. I finished it. I loved it. It broke the dam for me. Like I played Chrono Trigger. I played Earthbound. Uh, so it's always been kind of like a like a, like an important game for me. I guess you could say yeah. just like on like my appreciation of genres. So I was very excited for this. My my sort of hesitancy about it was like, uh, is it going to hold up? Like, how true to the original are they being? And and the answer is like they're actually being quite true to the original. And I think like all the stuff that makes it like more modern and contemporary, or it's like really behind the scenes stuff. Like I think they turned up the dials on like how much experience you get, okay, and stuff like that. So like you're not farming and you're not like going out of your way to fight additional enemies and that kind of thing it just feels smooth they added some new mechanics for like uh you can do these triple attacks which were not in the original game and you get these like pre-rendered cutscenes depending on like who's in your party and they do this big crazy attack which which is funny because to me that feels like a throwback to like the 32-bit era of rpgs even though Mario RPG is a 16-bit era RPG. It's like they threw in this other additional throwback, which is kind of fun. Uh, same with like pre-rendered cutscenes and certain story moments. Yeah, but um, I mean, it, I just I really love it. Like I, okay, I think great. it's great. I think it I think it holds up. Like I don't I haven't like handed it to somebody who doesn't who didn't play the original and like to get their feedback yet. But like I just felt it was like really smooth it's really it's simple in a way that i like you know it's just like that's you, what I, yeah that's what i'm trying like, to figure out is like is it too simple because like i love the paper mario games and i've started mario rpg several times and i've never made it through and now i'm wondering if you know loving paper mario and despite that like going back to this one it's just going to feel like oh this is a less funny simpler version of paper mario um yeah because you've said before which i think is is funny is that like your version of the best video game is basically the paper mario template yes right that's of right. like it's an rpg you grow your party as you progress and then you 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 get stronger and stronger and then you beat god at the end right is like kind of like you know your favorite type of game and this is like you gotta paper- get god <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, i, know, you I just think game, baldur's gate 3 should be closer to paper mario is it that weird of a take <laughs> but I mean, Paper Mario is born from this game, and and yeah. Ben in particular, I think you would really like it because know, it is yeah. so straightforward. Like, yeah. it's, and they've they've cleaned up enough around the edges where it doesn't get like boring or re- too repetitive. Like, you are fighting a lot of enemies, but the fights are fast and fun, and the time button pressing means that like you're much more engaged with it than you would be sort of a typical turn based game. And it's like it's a game where you're Mario and you get stronger, and you know you get a party member every couple of hours, and depending on sort of how you arrange that party like that will depend on how that will change how you approach fights and it's not as funny as paper mario yeah but there are there are a lot of funny bits and like the other great thing about it is like they really kept it true to the original to the point where like there's a lot of stuff that i don't think would have flown for like modern nintendo true okay like there's like dialogue options where mario could be like a total jerk you know, like some you'll see some kid like some toad jumping on a bed. And it's like, oh, Mario, do you think I'll be able to jump as high as you one day? And your choices are like, yeah, kid. Or like, no, there's no way you'll ever be as good as me, <laughs> oh, which is like modern Mario would not uh, talk that way. I don't think. And there's still like weird sort of just out of the blue references to other Square and Nintendo franchises yeah, all over the place. Yeah. Like it's uh, I, I really am very happy with it. It's like it's the it's. It's what I usually want from remakes where it's like, yeah, we overhauled the visuals. It is up to date visually. We made it play better. But like other than that, like it's really the same. I think there's a couple of little like localization things that they changed. Like one I noticed was they changed an enemy in the beginning from Kink Link, which was like a chain chomp, like holding a chandelier. Perfect. His name was Kink Link. Now it's. Uh, fetish link now, <laughs> <laughs> now it's uh now it's chain delir is what they call it yeah, so i think oh. there's little things like that but the weirdness is still there good the good good center and that's and and i love it for that reason and ben i i hope you do check it out I do, I think, I do especially want to. with your paper mario love yeah i think you will like in particular get get a lot out of it and enjoy it i'm just i'm debating ooh, is this gonna be enough to pull me away from star ocean 2 which i still have so much love and enthusiasm and yeah. momentum with right now it's like i don't know if i want to <laughs> put it on pause even for a bit just in case i lose it uh, yeah i mean this is new for you right where star like 
Star well, Ocean. I, I see of stars in Star Ocean this year. It's always going to throw me off. But yeah. like Star Ocean is like a nostalgic experience. It is, yeah. Like, and I'm yeah. still slightly nostalgic over Mario RPG. I mean, I played it, started it on an emulator, you know, back in the day, you know, and whatnot. But uh, there's yeah. there's an ounce of nostalgia there. But it was, I, it I am was, curious to jump in for sure. It was also fun because I realized as I was playing, I really remember the beginning vividly because like your first fight in the game is ostensibly Bowser in the castle, which is like a fun way to start a Mario game. Yeah, that's right. And I remember the, the very last fight because, you know, it's a memorable end game fight. Right? But like I really had very little memory for everything in yeah. between. And I was like, I don't remember these characters. I don't remember this town. I go into a volcano. I, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, I know we sound like complete wimps. Like, oh, don't make us play the games. But I was delighted to see it's apparently between like 10 and 15 hours as well. Like really yes. close to the yeah. like a Dragon Guide end time. Uh, and which I time adds up. <laughs> it does. Keep adding these on there. But Jen, it's just <laughs> 10 hours. Come on, you sleep 10 hours. What's the difference? I, which I believe is like looking at how long to beat and stuff because yeah. I think I came in at about 12 or 13 okay. and that was going out of my way to fight some of the optional bosses and stuff like really? that. Really? Wow. And that's the original sweet. Okay. was like 15 to 16. So I think they just, like I said, I think they just cleaned things up to make mm-hmm. the pace better. You that's know, sweet. I think there's like fewer enemies and you get more experience. So it's just like, it's just smoother overall without changing the core of the game, which yeah. is great. I, I hope it sells uh, like bananas. Uh, is that a phrase? I mean, like it's it also it's, it's also really banana. nice. What could it cost? <laughs> <laughs> one copy of Super Mario RPG. Um, I also like that um, it, a- after kind of being underwhelmed by the recent Paper Mario's and the lack mm. of sort of progression, it's nice to have a Mario RPG that's yeah. like, yeah, you're leveling up and you're getting stronger. Is that what you want from this genre? And it's like, yes, I do. Thank you. I, yeah. I've, I've missed this. Yeah. What do you think is going to sell better, this or the remake of Thousand Year Door next year? Ooh. I mean, probably this, because this is like, this is a bigger overhaul. And I think that's more enticing. Yeah. Where Stronger Thousand name. Your Door is like a remaster. This is a remake, which yep. I think it makes it a little more enticing. But yeah, that's a good question. I don't okay. know. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. To see. I mean, Super Nintendo install base versus GameCube install base. Like, I, I'm curious to see how it all shakes out. But yeah, I hope this yeah. thing sells well, because, um, you know, years ago now, we interviewed the game's director on MinMax's YouTube channel, which I'm still really proud of that interview. I think it was fun to to find him of uh, Fujioka. And uh, he said that he's still dying to make the sequel to this game. And I think it'd be oh, so cool, be cool if this remake sold so well that Nintendo brought him back and let him direct the sequel finally that he has in his head for Super Mario yeah. RPG. So Why don't I get fun. Luigi in there? He's of overdue. Of course, of course. Uh, thirsty suitors, man. Mm. Uh, you been playing this thing, Leo? I have. Sweet. This is the game. Annapurna published it, so you know it's a certain level of quality. And then Outer Loop Games made it. Their last game was Falcon Age, that Falconry game that always All looked right. very cool, if you remember seeing that one around. But they this look similar, is, these two games. <laughs> basically the same. This is um, the gross way to boil it down, Leo. Correct me if I'm wrong, is it's uh, a Scott Pilgrim vs. the World meets Yakuza RPG. Yeah. That's it? Meets skateboarding game. With skateboarding in there. Okay. That's the way you navigate the open world is by skateboarding around, and there are also skateboarding challenges. But it's less like balance, combo, uh, risk, reward, and more choosing, like Sonic, choosing rail to rail to wall run, building those kind of combos. Okay, right on. Yeah, I remember um, at GDC, I saw a presentation from the game's director who... Seems like a young guy, but then, I mean, he worked at, like, Bethesda in 1996. Like, he goes way back in the industry. It's wild to see. But I think he even, in that presentation, mentioned, like, yeah, a lot of people just say, like, oh, this is, like, Yakuza. And at a certain point, it's like, you know what? Yes, we're we're honored to be compared to Like a Dragon specifically with the turn-based stuff. Uh, but what do you think? Uh, the comparison being it's turn-based and the animations you're yes. watching are awesome. Okay. Just big, weird attacks? Yep. Stylized, weird things. Every time you start a battle... Your character cartwheels in, and as she cartwheels, her jacket like flies off, and her Walkman flies off, or whatever. And it's not like a dust cloud where these things happen. It's you see the jacket slide off her arms, which like stuns me every time. I feel like we see that so rarely. There's so much cool style in the in the little animations, in like the cooking mini games and stuff. Ooh. It's very exaggerated, hyper stylized, juggling the pan or whatever. It really does remind me of Yakuza Seven, like a Dragon One in that way. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going around oh and like boy. fighting your exes? Is that the premise? Yeah. If a lot of them are your exes. Sometimes they're just random people. Uh, and like a lot of the uh, random encounters you have, RPG style, because everybody is trying to hit on you, pretty much. Those are the thirsty suitors. The random encounters you have are men that your grandma's trying to set you up with. 
<laughs> which oh, yeah. is really funny. <laughs> and they have a lot of personality. The, the turn-based fights aren't totally my bag. The strategizing here is figuring out what they're weak to, like trying to shock them or break their hearts or whatever, and then capitalizing off of the debuffs you get from that. And it's filled in with a lot of flavor text, flavor dialogue between the characters. And that kind of clues you into what they might be weak to, what they're self-conscious about. That's like the depth, which is kind of cool. But it's mostly the animations that make the combat uh, worthwhile. Yeah. It, it seems like it's for a small team, like they're trying to tackle a lot. Like once I saw the whole skateboarding stuff, I'm like, okay, this is this is where you guys are going to drop the ball because that's a tough thing to pull off. But how's the skateboarding in the game? Um, It's not perfect, but it's really solid. I feel like this game slides right into like double A status sure, sure. above maybe indie in terms of like production value because it is 3D third person over the shoulder. And there's lots of distinct little uh, gameplay opportunities. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, overall, I think it's 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 really polished. And I have a little some clunk over trying to go to, from a rail to another rail and overshooting it or whatever. But you know, in a, any kind of sports game like this, I always feel like, well, there's a learning curve. I just haven't quite gotten up yet. Yeah. And so enjoying it more than you thought, like planning on second with that level. Um, probably not all the way. Who who has the time this late in the year? But it's only it's, it's only really nine hours, Leo. I mean, everyone has time for a nine to ten hour game. Just slot it in. How many could there possibly this, be? This past <laughs> weekend, I was like, I have three games to play for the podcast, plus Alan Wake for the Deepest Dive. That sounds fun. And then I get to it, it's like, well, if I divide my gaming time up by four, it's like forty five minutes per game. <laughs> <laughs> this actually sucks. <laughs> Hold on, <laughs> that's all you really need. No, but you know, it's funny you talking about this before. Like, I have it, and I haven't played the full build yet i played it at sgf and I, that was an intentional choice on my part i think the writing in the style is bonkers i think it's really cool i i would like to spend more time with it to give it more of a fair shake but for me leo the the pacing of the combat was the thing i didn't like it's a little slow because there's so much like story weaved into it i'm like uh yeah like that that's kind of what kept me from yeah having it higher on my list for things that i want to get to uh sure. with this i think that's part of the the con of like a year that's so stacked with so many incredible games. I'm like, well, I have so many incredible things to get to. Like, do I, where do I want to spend my time? And I like chose not to spend it there after my preview time with it. Yeah. But yeah, Thirsty Suitors, everybody, it's available on all the consoles, available on Steam as well. You can check it out there. Shout out. It's cool to see people enjoying it that much. And Game uh, Pass as well, I believe. Right? I don't think so. You can double check okay, it. Okay, never mind. Nice try, though. You can't just say that I for tried. everything. That feels you like it should You say it for a lot of things, though, and often you're right. So it's, right. it's not a bad Mario instinct. RPG this episode, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Lies of P, Kyle. Good game. And? On Game Pass. There we yeah. go. Uh, I played it on my Steam Deck, though, so it doesn't count. Jacob, I don't know why I've connected you with Liza P for so long. I feel like multiple times I've sent you a message to be like, hey, you're playing Liza P, right? Should we talk about it on the podcast? You're like, no, I haven't gotten to it. I haven't gotten to it. But now you finally got to it, and... I, I'm here to preach the gospel. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, nice. I, it, it, was, it was one that I, like, I thought I would enjoy. I played the demo. I thought the demo was, like, pretty fun, but... It's it's lengthy. I knew it's lengthy. I knew that it's very hard. I was just kind of like, I don't know if I'm ready to sign up for, you know, this just yeah. kind of like a big undertaking. Um, and then I, uh, I I did like last, I guess, two Fridays ago. And I like feel like I basically played it continuously until like, you know, that Tuesday when I beat it. Like it is it is so good. I, it really this is going to be, I feel like, one of those... I feel like I'm going to have multiple of these on the 210s because I'm also the only one that played Armored Core 6. But it, I would feel like, if you guys played this, you would get... It's great. It's so good. Yeah. I mean, Janet, you <laughs> have... I spent, like, a lot of time with it. I just I haven't beaten it yet. But, um, yeah, I think I was... I was on one of the earlier episodes where we talked about it after it had came out. And, yeah, like, I love that game. The only thing keeping me from going back right now is fear of embracing the stress that it causes me. But... I and also the fear of it will get too hard for me, but I haven't hit that wall yet. I've yeah. been getting through it and I love it. Like what the where you were, like what the most recent boss you fought was? Lightly vaguely. I did um I think the last thing I did was a mini boss. It was the person that wears like the mask in front of the elevator. I think I'm a little farther than that. Do you know that? It's like an optional um, boss. It's hmm. after the fiery boy. I call him Fuecoco. Okay, yeah, yeah, his yeah. Name. <laughs> but it looks like Fuecoco, which is a Pokemon. Yes. But like yeah, the name think, looks like that when you like I, glance at it. 
I think I'm one boss further than you, Jim. Yeah. And I'm similar. Oh, geez. All right. It's like, yeah, I'm really digging this. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. So the the bad news is there's a lot of game after that. Um, <laughs> but the good <laughs> news is it's so good. Uh, yeah. I, it's just. I like, heard they de- they nerfed some of the stuff too, which is good news for me. I know some people might be disappointed, but I'm like bring it all the way down I no there were actually there were multiple rounds where after patch there were a lot of bosses that got tweaked pretty significantly and then literally today like november 15th as we're recording this they have released another patch that actually makes things even like not necessarily making things easier but they're giving you more resources at mm. the beginning so you can okay. uh, you can invest in your p organ everyone you can get that p okay. organ rolling okay Come jacob on. now we see what you like um and it's it's just it's scratching an itch of bloodborne or it's going above me on that i i mean yes it is scratching the itch of bloodborne but there are a lot of things that i think it does that are really like you know there there are things that from software could learn from them oh. you know like the one of the things that i found very exciting about this game is like elemental effects are really effective and they give you many more opportunities to use them because in from software games it would kind of be like okay here's this thing you can rub on your sword and it'll catch on fire it's a one-time use. If you die, you don't get it back. And so then I'd just be like, well, I'm never going to use that because I'm too scared of wasting it. And Lies of B will give you like one of those that you can use twice every life, you know, mm. when you get them in like all of the elements. And so if a boss is weak to acid, you don't have to like go back and grind to make one acid weapon that might work against it or like grind to buy a bunch of these you can just like use it. And there, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of strategies like that. There are also things in this game like throwables do so much damage that if you are having a hard time on a boss, it's a legitimate strategy to just go and buy like 30 things you can throw at a boss and just chuck it at it. And that will Listening. like pretty reliably <laughs> take it down. <laughs> Taking notes. Yeah, yeah literally. Janet's got a notepad. There Why um, not? I'm getting through. I'm going to get through this thing one way yeah. or another. I'm seeing the other side. Okay. But I don't care like, what I have to do. Overall, I just think the, the world design is so good. The level design is so good. And like the bosses do that amazing from software thing of like, you are kind of in awe of them at the same time as you're, you know, really scared and want to beat them. Like, yeah. the, the animation work is just so good. Wow. All right. I, I love that you're loving this so much. Liza P, unfortunately, there are only 20 slots on the Game of the Year list uh, for MinMax, and there's nothing we can do to change that. And so this is going to be a tough year for everybody. <laughs> Have we considered a third 10? Just for this year, <laughs> do we have to add another hundred game? Yeah, I guess we'll have to I add mean, an I, N. Ben, you joke, but are you? Do you think that's not going to make the two tens? Lies of P. No, I think I think it will. I think it will. <laughs> I I just am scared. When, like when I start remembering stuff like Like a Dragon Ishin, where I'm like, oh my god, how are we gonna... like this? The two tens is the it's only ten hours of list. <laughs> where it's like yeah, Lies of P, Spider Man. Like we got plenty of room, and then you start to look, and it's like, well, there still are only twenty slots. But yeah, yeah. I'm. Very into Lies of P, and I hope to play more. I haven't picked it up since like September, yeah, out of fear. But it's it just, I mean, same thing Jacob says, it oozes with personality. I mean, we'll dig into it more, I'm sure, when it yeah. comes up. It's just, I just like, I can't believe how polished it is, is, is really so the real takeaway. You yeah. know, it's like, it's easily the best non from software souls like I've played, and for it to just be this game that we are all looking at for years and being like, there's no way they pull that. They're not actually <laughs> making another Bloodborne. Right. And then like they effectively did uh, is so impressive. That's wild. Last thing I want to shout out is I think it's really approachable, frankly, for, yeah. like the style of game it is um, as someone that really struggles to be able to latch on to souls like games, both from a mechanical perspective and an investment perspective. Um, like, I feel like if you like Demon Souls, you'll like this game it just has the that's satisfying and then i and then i put the key in the door oh and look the gates like where i was in the beginning like there's something so simple about so many of the aspects of this game while still having like tools that can aid you in explore like the depth is rolled out really slowly like mm-hmm. i think they tutorialize it very well so yeah i mean I, I definitely think people should check it out even if if you're at all open to trying Souls-like games, I think this is like an absolute must to spend a little time with because yeah. it, it might surprise you. That's sweet. Uh, hey, Kyle, do you know what might surprise you? 
uh, that I looked it up and Thirsty Suitors is on Game Pass. Wow. Thank is it really? for making me feel like a <laughs> lunatic. <laughs> I Googled it and I didn't see it that quickly. Is there an easy like, the go-to list. site? It's on the list. I'll I'm be damned. It's on the official site. It's wedged right between uh, Phoenix Wright and From Space. Hmm. That's right, Kyle. Patreon. Patreon.com <laughs> slash MinMax with two N's. Check out that site. Uh, we're working here to try and Create a cool outlet, and we could use your support to give it a boost. Uh, we're still so small that uh, your contribution really makes a big difference there. To find a tier that's right for you, we greatly appreciate it. Unlock a benefit over there. Thank you to some of our biggest supporters as well. I'm talking about the folks at Magic Mind. Y'all heard of Magic Mind? No. You're heard about of Magic to. Mike. I'm sorry. I meant to say we're sponsored this week by Magic Mike uh, Triple Hell Triple yeah. XL. Uh, no, Magic Mind. It's like. It's a little energy energy drink, a little uh, health drink, a little bit of everything there. But I've heard Pete Holmes on the You Made It Weird podcast. He's been talking about it for years in a way that is like one of those ad reads where I'm like, I would like to try that. And then when they reached out, I'm like, oh, perfect. Ship a whole batch to my house. This will be great. Uh, so it's a nice little blast of focus, uh, as they put it. It's a quick energy boost. It has all natural ingredients uh, like matcha. With with uh, which gives you an extended caffeine release, adaptogens. Show favorite. That's right, uh, adaptogens which reduce stress and anxiety, nootropics, um, and then on the list of ingredients on their site, I assume this was a typo, but um, they they list as an ingredient cordyceps mushrooms. But then they're so savvy, they then say, not the ones from The Last of Us, but a powerful (laughs) one nonetheless. An adaptogen that reduces inflammation, strengthens your immune system, and supports higher energy levels and physical endurance by ramping up the production of ATP in your mitochondria. I'll let you know if a mitochondria is feeling it. Hang on. Yeah, let us know. That's my mitochondria uh, screaming. Very Michael uh, Scott I, thought, of you. <laughs> I thought you were turning into a clicker. I don't know. What was <laughs> Magic Mind, everybody. You can check it out and you can get 56% off of your subscription for the next 10 days with the code MINMAX20. And you can go to magicmind.com slash MINMAX to enter that code. Magicmind.com slash MINMAX. Get 56% off your subscription for the next 10 days with MINMAX20 if you're interested in a little, little extra boost. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Factor Meals. Who's better than Factor Meals? No one. N- no one. <laughs> I got a big shipment of cordyceps uh, mushrooms <laughs> to my house the other day from Factor Meals. Couldn't be better. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. They can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-repaired, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, stay on track with your healthy lifestyle, all while tackling your holiday to-dos. Um, we had a thing recently where we had kind of like a stressful little quick weekend trip the other day and literally we got home and it was that level of like my wife being like oh my god dinner i need to go get groceries blah, blah, blah. and then we come home and there's a big box of factor meals sitting on the doorstep genuinely a wave of release i felt uh, just a, a relief is what i meant to say leo uh it was uh, delightful uh to be like okay now we have a ton of meals two minutes in the microwave to get these things ready to go uh, on top of that, there's a bunch of smoothies that are going to be on top of that, of uh, pumpkin spice smoothies that were all in there. So if you're too busy with holiday plans to cook, you can check out Factor Meals, everybody. Uh, this November, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your door. Ready in two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash minmax50. Use code minmax50 to get 50% off. That's code minmax50 at factormeals.com slash minmax50 to get 50% off. Also, thank you to our friends at Stamps.com. Hang on, I'm going to finish this magic mind just so I can really nail this Stamps.com rig. <laughs> Drink it before you lick your uh, stamps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we recommend the combining there, all of these. <laughs> Stamps.com, everybody. Uh, Hey, stop going to the post office, USPS stuff. If you have holiday shipping, and I bet you do, you got stuff to move around the world, Stamps.com is going to be a good option for you. We've got our big uh, Give to the Max charity stream happening uh, on December 2nd. We have a ton of charity auctions to ship out, and this year... I shan't be a fool. This year, I will be using stamps.com and printing out all of these things. Then I can just run in there, drop them off at the post office and say, ship them away, Bob. Uh, With stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything that you need. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money during the holiday rush for 25 years. 
You can give your business the gift of Stance.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Sign up with the promo code MINMAX for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stance.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, enter code MINMAX. Stance.com, they're everywhere for a reason, everybody. Also, thank you to our dear friends at I Am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know about Day of the Devs. Day of the Devs began in 2012 as a collaboration between Double Fine and I Am 8-Bit with the purpose of shining the spotlight on great indie games. Since then, the event has showcased over 500 games in both in-person and online events. And that is where you come in, because this December, it's time for Day of the Devs. Uh, there is a digital showcase on December 6th, happening at 8 a.m. Pacific on twitch.tv uh, slash the Game Awards. You can watch the digital showcase. It'll be a bunch of indie developers, Tim Schafer out there cracking jokes. It's a great way to get to know the developers and see some great games because it's very well curated. But the kicker is there's also an in-person celebration for Day of the Devs happening December 8th, going from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific. The event is hosted in LA, everybody, and you can RSVP. It's a free event. So if you want to go play some cool games, meet some cool indie developers in LA, you can go to Day of the Devs. There's a link below where you can RSVP. Otherwise, you can go to dayofthedevs.com where they have the link there as well. Janet, you're going to this thing, right? Yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, so I'm go there, it. check it out, everybody. Day of the Devs, the in-person celebration. Help support I Am 8-Bit there and everything they're doing. And you can go to I Am 8-Bit's wonderful online store and use the promo code Gobble Till You Wobble for 10% off of everything in I Am 8-Bit's online store that's under $100. Help support I Am 8-Bit overall because they support MinMax in such a big way. They've been with us for so long and they ship out a prize each and every week from their online store to the MinMax community. So whoever is the best community question this week is winning the Artful Escape on Nintendo Switch. Cool game, cool physical version thanks to I Am 8-Bit. So thanks for supporting MinMax's community here, everybody. Now... On to the guests, on to the community questions. Um, we're losing a couple wonderful folks along the way, but they're with us in spirit. Jacob and Kyle, uh, peace be with you. And oh. also with you. Thank you. My God, welcome to the show, Nathan Grayson and Gita Jackson from Aftermath. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Congratulations on the big launch last week. Does it feel like a year? Does it feel like yesterday? How are you feeling about the whole new site? I feel like we've always been doing... I mean, I've worked with Nathan before, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we used to sign into a Slack channel every day with each other and have arguments about headlines that would last 45 minutes. <laughs> but <laughs> now, so it feels like... Oh, this is we're this is just like my old job, except it's better than our old job because I'm we're all the boss and <laughs> we don't have a boss pulling rank over us anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really does feel like we've been doing this for longer than we have. Um <clears throat> but no, I mean it's been yeah. it's been amazing. I mean, we get to like, I don't know, a, one weekend it feels like the best job I've had uh ever. Yeah. And that, you know, we get to do a mixture of like stuff that matters and then just really silly things yeah um, um like your excellent blog about the five nights of freddy movie i was editing that it made me laugh out loud so many times <laughs> just your description of what the movie is about which it's about a man who lost his brother who is so traumatized by this that he takes sleeping pills and listens to sounds from the accident every night what yeah, in order to go back to the place <laughs> um and like try to see the try to like see the face of the man who Jesus. apparently kidnapped his brother yeah, it's wild. And he's been doing it for like apparently, you know, probably at least 15 years. And that guy is played by Pete Melark from the yeah. Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> what? Are we, am I just not on Twitter enough? Do you think we're talking enough about the impact of the Five Nights at Freddy's movies culturally? Because I mean, like it, it's mopping up at the box office, right? To yeah. a ridiculous degree, even the reviews were terrible. I mean, I, mean, I think it's yeah. less of like a cultural impact and more of like a reflection of, you know, where things are at. Like, you know, there there are a lot of people now who are Gen Z, um, who are in their twenties, um, who have disposable income, and also who grew up playing those games. I guess. And so, so like, of course, you know, a lot it of did parents well the box with children also like looking for a movie that we can all watch together. You know, mm -hmm. Five Nights at Freddy's is scary, is Halloweeny, but it's also you've watched your child play those games, so you kind of know what it is. You know, like you right. don't feel afraid of it. You know, right? So it it doesn't. It's a. Uh, I think too, it speaks to the testament of where culture is coming from now you know like nathan just said 
we millennials have are, are now the people with the expendable incomes and the families. So we that is being reflected in box offices like the Five Nights at Freddy's, <laughs> which is I can't believe it's real, but it's like a cultural powerhouse. You yeah, know, there's yeah. novelizations, there's so many spin-off games, there's this whole culture on YouTube, people who make like their entire careers out of playing Five Nights at Freddy's. Like I it's wild, but it's true. Yeah, I don't see any yeah. game spin-offs for Killers of the Flower Moon. Come on, Scorsese, get your crap together, <laughs> man. <laughs> anti-swirl culture video game. <laughs> I, I will add one really funny thing, though, because you talk about it like being, you know, a good movie for families to see. And by and large, I would agree with that. But there is a scene where somebody gets fully bifurcated. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like a Mortal um, Kombat bit? <laughs> um, like one of the uh, animatronics picks somebody up and just chomps them in half. And so, like, the camera cuts such that you don't see the actual, like, you don't see it, but you see a silhouette of it. You see the shadow of mm. it. So you see somebody just fall in half. Bioshock. And I was like, I can't okay. believe that they put this in a movie that I think is PG-13 or maybe, right. like, yeah. That's a tough I mean, one. that's, PG-13 was invented for Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that is some Raiders of the Lost Ark right there. You yeah. Know? yeah. Like, I guess yeah. so. Yeah, you got to do it. Uh, by the way, uh, Nathan, get it. you're on with uh, Janet and Leo. Uh, oh, hello. They're welcome. Welcome to the uh, podcast. Nice the big group you. here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I'm fascinated by the idea of like, you know, you two used to work together at Kotaku, right? Yeah. And the idea yeah. of like launching Aftermath, is it too simple of a shorthand? Correct me if I'm wrong, but like having this whole community funded take with Aftermath of just like, can we just get back to creating the type of content we really liked to create in Kotaku years and years ago, but just a cleaner, healthier feeling version of that. Is that the, is that the that super the quick pitch. shorthand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The pitch. yeah. When Luke came to me in a DM, he was like, literally let's do our jobs without all the bullshit. Right. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, yeah, please. I would love to. <laughs> it's a really good feeling when you can pull it off. Absolutely. Like, okay, we just can yeah. curate a healthier feeling version of that. Who wouldn't want that? And it's also great because Luke is like the least bullshit tolerant person that i know yeah and so he's kind of the ideal person to run a site like this with because if ever bullshit creeps in he's like no that's that's stupid what no, the, we're like we don't need to do that australians are so blunt i don't know why i've gotten to know so many australian expats but the he'll just be like no this is stupid and i'm just like i can't i can't argue with you you've just identified the problem immediately like his uh blog yesterday about why video game media headlines are so inscrutable right, sometimes. Right, I love that blog because this is something he did do for many, many years, but also, like, we knew it was bullshit at the time. And it's nice to just actually say it. Like, this is this is a form of bullshit that comes with being a part of an ad-supported media group. Right. Where also where the idea for growth is not normal scalable where we're just trying to support ourselves and hopefully grow to support ourselves better and expand but to create an endless stream of revenue to support the salaries of the c-suite which yeah, is in, these yeah millionaires who already don't need it and there also who aren't be, producing anything they're just there was a, a person that worked in our hr department at kotaku that could not send an email with an attachment like failed at doing this three different times in a row and was <laughs> hey, she was earning a quarter of a million dollars a year oh, I, I, oh, <laughs> it hurt so much <laughs> This um, is you know, awkward. I'm not surprised to learn that we didn't earn anything even near that. No, I was making 50K in New York for so long. It was really mm -hmm. hard. Of course. This is awkward because yeah. everybody at MinMax is millionaires. Yeah, I can't <laughs> figure. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I mean, Every week, Ben's like, how are we nice going to double mind, the so. Patreon, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it is <laughs> growth. I gotta say, like, to into well, into your Patreon awesome. funds, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've talked about it on the podcast a, a fair bit, just about like how so many gaming sites, especially on mobile, just feel unusable at this point. And I feel like every time I've gone to Aftermath so far, it's just like, ugh, oh, just a nice, clean video game site with some interesting headlines. Is this oh too much God. to ask yeah. for, everybody? I it's know. so usable. Yeah, that's the weird <laughs> thing. It makes you feel like your phone is a bomb. Like, right. You know? <laughs> yes, that's exactly yeah. it. Uh, uh, that, yeah, so if people want to check out the site, support it, uh, where should they go? How should they do it? All that fun stuff. They should go to aftermath.site. It's even a very simple URL. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, if you can, if you got some spare change laying around, please subscribe. We are fully reader funded. And so that's what, you know, allows us to pay ourselves. Um, hopefully, eventually we'll be able to pay ourselves like a full-time salary. We're still getting there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. every bit counts. 
Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff that we'd love to be able to do. A lot of people have asked for, you know, more freelance work, which we definitely <laughs> want to be able to support freelancers. It's just right. we are 100 percent reader supported. And so far, that has been the growth has been amazing. The sub initial support has been amazing. But I hope that we can prove to everyone that if you just write good stuff, people will pay for it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. That's the mission. Yeah. Love it. And then we can uh, hire some more people, too, because we have our eyes on a few um other former yeah. co-workers that we would like to rescue. We want to complete the <laughs> super group. We want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So right now everyone's just kind of in a part-time situation with it and just that flexibility of like we'll scale up, scale down um, as we need to. We we're treating it as a full-time job right now, but in terms of the amount of money that we can make from it, it like, you know, a couple months down the line we might have to or at least some of us might have to reevaluate. Although we're hoping it won't reach that point. Like yeah. we're we're growing really fast right now. Mm-hmm. And so in a couple months time, we could well be making enough money that we're just like, yep, this is our full time job now. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll see. Yeah. I would love to not have two jobs. <laughs> that would be so sick. It'd be nice. um, but like aftermath is my baby. So I mm-hmm. want to see my baby grow strong and healthy. <laughs> yeah. I want it to become really, really large and tall. Yeah, intimidatingly exactly. so, but it still looks like a baby. Well, so, yeah, it's kind of yeah. so basically, yeah, uh, uh, honey, I blew up like, the kid scenario, I think. And then you need to play the yeah. Hard Rock Cafe guitar on the streets, I think, for the full the experience. Perfect kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James Pies uh, rates in over on our Patreon. They say, hey, for the special guests, how close were you to actually naming the site Afterlife, but change course once you realized it would share a name with the bar on Omega and Mass Effect 2? Best of luck on oh. the new endeavor. Afterlife Even more was Afterlife not- stuff. Was not in the was not in the name pile. We had a no. bunch of different names in the name pile, and they were all bad except for Aftermath. Yeah, <laughs> all right, get- a lot of them sounded like insurance companies. I'm not yeah. even joking. Ooh, One yeah. of them yeah. really was. Yeah. One of our ideas was Vanguard, and then we realized that is an insurance company. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's tough. I, what I like about Aftermath is that it sounds like they could have been on the Corn Family Values Tour. <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah, no. The other day, um, somebody sent us an email. And it was addressed to like the scoundrels of Aftermath. And I was like, I would read that fantasy novel. That sounds great. (laughs) Absolutely. Please refer to us as scoundrels more often. I love it. (laughs) Uh, Hey, we got a bunch of questions from the community here. If you're ready to start flying through some of these, jump in. Don't be shy. Uh, Jeffum's backlog, apparently uh, personified Mm -hmm. here, wrote in. They said, (laughs) it's time for Game of the Year Backlog Promises. Previously on Game of the Year Backlog Promises, uh, Ben famously declared that there was no world in which I didn't finish Elden Ring. And by golly, he got it done. Thank you. I did. Mm. Thank you for noticing that. Allegedly uh, got it done. Allegedly, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stream the ending and believe it or not, it came up a lot in our Game of the Year debates. Anyways, mm-hmm. the point is, <laughs> for this year, what is the game that you promise you'll finish in time for the Game of the Year season and that you feel ben, like is a requirement to having a fulfilling game of the year discussion do you remember the pact we made each other i do remember we shook digital hands I and i think about this in a cold sweat every morning when i wake up and be like <laughs> why did i promise okay, that we do on, it uh, we, we shook hands and said that we'd finish bayonetta origins this year <laughs> wow. which is a game that wow. to be fair it was a delusional time we was it was we were young it was like february you know that's the problem <laughs> that's like the we're problem. both friends right like at least you just, had each other yeah, yeah. it's like the idea of like oh it's like a 15 hour game game solid eight out of ten that absolutely time for it absolutely time for it and now i i feel like i should be we are locked living up. in an era of an embarrassment of riches when it comes to really mm-hmm. really good video games yes I've, I've not finished some games that i really 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 like just because another game was coming out yeah. but that was that's basically me going from Armored Core 6 to Alan Wake immediately. Just like, yeah, I'm not even done with air. I will finish Armored Core 6. I guess that's my pledge. Ooh, and I also go. will fill, finish Alan Wake, even though it scares me so much. I'm too terrified. Without I mean, that spoiling been, anything. Like, my whole year, honestly, yeah. it's just been monkey barring between games that I haven't finished or that have been like too long to finish. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I started the year. Um, well, I did finish Yakuza 0 this year. It only took me four years to do. Oh, but no. I did it. Okay. <laughs> And then I went to Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which I had played a lot of last year. Picked that back up, got super into it, made it to basically the final act. Then Zelda came out. So I played Zelda for like 100 hours. Yeah, then Baldur's, 3, Baldur's Gate 3 came out. So I played that for like 100 hours. Then Cyberpunk got updated. And so I have played that for like 50 hours. I've not finished any of these. These are all unfinished. <laughs> it's tough. I hate having that guilt of like, God, I want to fight really hard for this for the game of the year. Like where I'm at right now is the Star Ocean 2 remake. I'm like, I'm so red hot on that. But I feel like I will not be able to stand confidently in that fight unless I see credits roll in the Star Ocean 2 remake. Mm. We call it the Bradley Default 2 effect, Janet. Um, <laughs> hey, sorcerer. I still got it on there. Well, Jeff did it for me. So. Yeah, 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 really yeah. I've heard that's really good. It I actually, good. I, I've been meaning to play that. 
Yep, I know it's it tight. Really good. It, there's a lot going on. Wait, are you talking Bravely Default 2 or Star Ocean 2, Nathan? Uh, Bravely Default. Damn it! <laughs> well, yeah. it's got Star Ocean, I've actually heard, is incredibly bad now. And <laughs> oh, oh, the, the streets oh. are saying, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> People think it's really good. Leo, what do you got on your list that you can fulfill the promise of finishing before the end of the year? Even when there's no competition, I still have a brain parasite that makes me get to the last boss in games and then not finish it. It's yeah. always been a problem for me. All the time. I have a save <laughs> file of a Persona 3 somewhere where it's right outside of the final boss, and it's just I haven't played since then. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's extra hard mode this year with so much other good stuff. I really want to finish Shadow Gambit, The Cursed Crew, because that's yeah. one of my favorites of the year. Hell yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm right at the end of that. And Tears of the Kingdom I do want to go back to because I'm right mm. at the end, uh, story-wise. And I want to... To give that game a truly fair shake, I want to get back in the mindset of it before our end of the year. Because it's really easy for me to leave it in the past. There's been so many games I'm really, really hot on since then. Well, that's where Link is used to being. But yeah, that's the thing. is like what you and <laughs> Jeffum... Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all day. Uh, that's where like you and Jeffum and Kelsey I feel like all stopped right at the end of Tears of the Kingdom. And I... I, but you all have said, like, oh, we want to go back and finish it right before Game of the Year stuff. And I, I hope everybody has time to, because just to remind yourself of the magic of the game. And that's a game that I think ends really, really, really well, too. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that'll boost it a little bit, maybe, for any potential conversations about Game of the Year. Who can say? Uh, Janet, Alan Wake 2, I saw your your tweeting about, like, being right at the yeah. end. You need to finish that one off. Yeah, I have so many things that riddle me with guilt. Honestly, Alan Wake 2 up there. And then, like, weird take. And this is going to sound so irrelevant because I've never talked about this game on this show. Uh, the many pieces of Mr. Ko or Ku. Wh- what? It's a it's a I, I think it's an indie game. But now these days, I'm afraid to say without Googling the studio. <laughs> but um, it's a really short game. It's like maybe like 90 minutes and I'm like an hour into it. <laughs> what? Um, it's real. It is really cool. It is a point and click adventure surrealist game. Uh, it's a puzzle game and it is very much a puzzle game where you are sensing out the solutions because everything is with surrealist logic so you really have to just kind of play with the environment and that one i i want on there because that, that's kind of my hot take pick because it's so sh- it's so short yeah i'm so far in and i really want to finish it and kind of to echo leo's um affliction <laughs> i think it's really easy to get a lot of games on the ropes and be like oh no like with one dedicated weekend i can knock out like these five games and you know and then you end up never doing it so yeah i have a lot of titles like that so i want to put that as mine to sort of represent all the games that hang on the ropes for me that i refuse to kill that's good that's I, good i've always had a fantasy of like motivating myself to do it by like having a single like weekend long twitch stream or something like that yes. this Friday, yeah. just I'm doing all of them in a row yeah, yeah, you're gonna do it. It. yeah yeah i want to wake uh, up yeah. and then i'm just going live and i'm like <laughs> can we absolve ourselves of guilt today yeah. <laughs> yeah. peer pressure janet into finishing all of her games that she yes. has to finish uh, janet we shook on it and um spilled blood and uh smeared it together in an agreement that we would finish bayonetta origins but how are you feeling at this point do you think we're going to finish bayonetta origins by that point, the end of the year <laughs> i think we should for the for like the memes right like you oh, know what i mean and no one else cares about us but like should we for the cold or should we both agree to not finish it and make a new pact to just not beat if it. If we perfectly reverse our handshake, it nulls and voids <laughs> all agreements made on the podcast. I can get, I can get down. With I'm that. not ready to, to throw in the towel yet because I do feel like, especially with like you know Kamiya leaving Platinum, I feel like this is this is the swan song. This is the way to experience his final work at Platinum before he headed out the door. You know, and and it does seem up my alley, but okay, I I. I'm still vaguely committing to it. I think. Okay, it's, uh, you know what's fine. We'll stay commit. Uh, you know what? I will add it to my. Um, I have 16 games. I claim that I'm playing on backlog. <laughs> Let's make it 17, Ben. Yep, I'm gonna put is. that back on there. <laughs> yeah, Chan no, yeah. watching us. Uh, Chan one one five zero at the backstage pass watching us live. Uh, thank you for supporting us. Uh, they say I think you two should beat it because that would be kind of dumb. That's kind of the way I feel about it. Yeah, it's like that's a good honestly game, what I, I'm like for the this. Yeah, for the content, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, right, right, right. commit to the bit. Like, right. exactly. Yes. Yeah. And it's a good yeah. game. It's not like we're yeah. committing to trash. Like, you know, we're yeah, just yeah. thinking it'll I make you two it. tens. No. If you beat it? No, I think it'll be number 26 if we beat it, if I'm being honest. I think it, I mean, I don't think it'll make the two tens, but I feel like it won't not make it. You know what I mean? Like, it could be in the conversation. <laughs> sure. And if we beat it, we can make 
people hear that conversation back. That's right. They have no right. choice. Plus, I they think already it's like the podcast. I think the most fun thing about the game of the year debates and stuff is when you find those unlikely alliances. You know, like I love just being like, okay, I'm allied with this person on this one, allied with this person. This this debate, we're gonna be mortal enemies. But I like having that game that like if Janet and I can yeah. just like lock arms on this one, that feels fun to me. You, me, and nobody saves the world, man. I'll see you there. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, Travis and Fargo writes in, by the way, and says, I get extremely excited to listen to everyone's Game of the Year content. What do you look forward to? And is there anything you dread about Game of the Year debates? Oh, my God. I, <laughs> um, we used to, at Kotaku, just go through a, a gauntlet. It felt like physical combat every day. <laughs> like, it, it was so rough. Like, you, you'd go in and you'd say... I want all of we all put in our games for like what we wanted to have people play to so that we could yeah. all have a fair debate. And then the next day someone would take one of your games that you really wanted to be on the Kotaku top ten and just be like, This game fing sucks. Ugh. I hate this game. <laughs> and you'd feel like absolute garbage for like a week. <laughs> uh, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm gonna say. It's what I dread. I I feel like for me, I've always felt like game of the year lists are so arbitrary and like mm -hmm. so hard to compile because I don't really even remember January of this year, if I'm being perfectly honest. And this year is especially hard because so many games are so good. But I, I truly I love finding a game that we can all agree is like a pinnacle of the industry every year. But the way that you determine it is so difficult it just feels like by the end of it i don't even care <laughs> well this is the thing i mean you, this is your chance to do a, a healthier version of it at aftermath right so what's what's the healthy new take on how you do a game of the year stuff god i mean i think unranked lists are the best kind of game yeah. like an unranked list of 10 yeah. i think that is more representative of the industry because like the video, video game industry is not just like really deep, but it's also really wide. There are a lot of different kinds of games. There are games that I play on my phone, like literally every day, like Two Dots. Like I, I play that yep. game every day, you know, and there is games that I get deeply engrossed in that I know will continue to build time over time, like The Sims 4, uh, which has a new expansion coming out where you get to build apartment buildings that I'm extremely excited about. <laughs> uh, and there's also these massive event games that I think most people think of when they're thinking about game of the year stuff, stuff that came, comes from prestige studios or are the flagship games of a, of a company like Nintendo that when they come out, they kind of absorb all of the conversation around them for months at a time. And those games are also really, really time consuming. But I, I picking one singular game of the year, like I, I often think about the Oscars, like the, 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 as, a, as a corollary to this debate, and it's difficult for them also to represent their industry fully. And but so frustrating about having to award a winner is that you don't get to talk about the achievements that have happened across the industry and many different sectors and spheres of it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's just frustrating. It's frustrating. Yeah, well, it's yeah. also just like, you know, and I, I think this is kind of a natural thing within the world of video games, but it frames it as a competition. And it's like, it doesn't need to be this thing where one thing is better than another thing is better than another is better than another. Um, you know, it would be very easy for people to just be like, this thing was cool. So is this thing. That's kind of it. Like, we don't need to be, you know, like in the trenches and slinging yeah. mud at each other over something that fundamentally like doesn't even make sense when you're talking about like an art form or a medium or whatever. You're right. It's yeah. just all very tiresome. I hear you fully. But then again, like listening God. to gaming podcasts, like <laughs> that's so true. It, I think I, when I listen to other sites, and podcast and outlets that are just like, oh, we're just going to list a bunch of our favorite games of the year. It feels so flat and boring. Like, I, you know, I don't know if I'm part of the problem here, but I like having that ring. I like having a little bit of that debate, respectful debate. And as long as mm -hmm. everyone agrees, like, it's a silly thing to come up with a list, especially a rank list of the best games of the year. That's why I think, like, doing it publicly makes me, me feel better because you kind of get a sense of there's no real authority here. We're just yeah. trying our best to, to boil down our passions for the year, you know? And I don't think yeah. it makes people get less mean because that is definitely the the bad part. That's what I remember from the Game Informer uh, debates was, yeah. yeah, coming away with a bad feeling because people really dumped on stuff you like. And we have less of that. I've been listening back to our 210s debates, getting ready for this upcoming one because I'm really excited about it. And I feel like over the years, we did get better and better at that. A trick from the pros, 
Say an oath at the start about how you're all going to respect each other. I feel like that legitimately <laughs> yes. made a difference. Everyone was so mad I mean, about that's that. That's a really good idea. Everybody well, hated honestly. it last year. I, I thought. mean, I do genuinely think like having an audience does prevent you from just dumping on your teammates. You know, the people right. that you're going mm-hmm. to work to every day because. Part of being in front of an audience is that you are performing for them a little bit for their benefit. And that's that can be the bad, like a performative uh, relationship with, you know, it's a yeah. it can be very stressful, but also it does keep you on your best behavior. Right. Like it <laughs> it prevents you from just saying that you think your, your friend's taste is garbage and that they're <laughs> stupid. you know. Right. And that's why I think yeah. every office kitchen should just be live streamed at all times so everybody oh out through the workforce yeah. would just be a little bit nicer state, surveillance state surveillance the ongoing state. yeah <laughs> surveillance state's cool if there's subs rolling in on twitch that's that's good content man was I the feedback it's... to the oath really negative from from us or from the audience i thought that um, the sense i had from doing that oath last year is everyone was really annoyed with it by the end and was angry but maybe listening to it again leo i was just really sensitive in my own head about it maybe it's a vulnerable thing to do it is it was. write an oath yeah. I just didn't like Keep saying it because the saying it was under it. was was right. weird because it was all out of sync and it was very long. But I think it the sentiment long. of the oath is valid. I do think it's that fine line of, you know, my brother listened to the two tens also from that year. And he was like, I feel like you guys having that what we called. What do we call it? It's something gross, like the pissy section or something. The pissy the zone. Yeah. The pissy where zone. We, where like, we really I let felt like rip. everyone got so excited for that part, though. And it's like maybe it needs more bite in some ends but i think i I think with it's kind of like salt right if you put too much it ruins it and you can't go back so Mm -hmm. i think it's always good to err on the side of caution there and i like that we have i think the two tens takes a lot of the pressure off because it's a list of it's a list of 20 right 10 plus 10 um or the two tens right there is no list of 20 i think that is really fun because you see more games yeah i think the thing the only con of top 10 lists is 10's just such a short space. We yep. can kind of guess a lot of those games. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I think it's fun to talk about Tuesday of the Kingdom and Baldur's Gate 3, and I'm looking forward to it. But at the same time, it's like, those are almost kind of the most boring parts in a way. Like, even with ours, where you're like, oh, well, let's not put, El- we don't know where Elden Ring will be. I'm like, yeah, we do. It's going to be at the top. And right, like, right, right. <laughs> and then that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like, I know it's going to be one or two. And that's fine. You know, we'll have that conversation when it comes to it. But what's more interesting is the the other meat um, when you're, you, can, on the you other want to be surprised of, you know you don't want to yeah, be able to like guess we actually it before you figure that out yeah well, the hardest part of compiling list of Kotaku is that sort of six to ten space where the, the mm-hmm. one through yeah. five is like we know what we, we you always know what's in the one through five so because everyone was looking forward to those games everyone's played those games everyone's seen the incredible coverage of those games like it should be obvious but in that back half is where you get to sneak in your favorite yeah and that's where people get super 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 passionate i remember arguing so hard for doki doki literature club the year that they came out and not enough of my colleagues had played it or were interested in the project for it to make it onto the list and i felt incredibly bitter for the rest of the year (laughs) (laughs) yeah you don't forget it easily i get it uh not weirder writes in they say hey min mafter math that's us (laughs) um (laughs) People seem to be focusing a lot on what game has the best story, the best combat, best art style, but they're all missing something important this year. What game from 2023 has the best name? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I gotta be like, I gotta go with a big game for this one only because I appreciate what they did with it. Yeah. I think that Tears of the Kingdom has the best name because it has a double meaning. It's tears like, you know, what the kingdom is going through, sadness, and also tears like there are three different levels to the kingdom. Mm. Yeah. It's tiered. Yeah. yeah tears of the kingdom it's so there you go. and like Eminem. it's also one of those things where like it was already like a translation from a japanese title so to be able to like get that all in there yeah like, that takes some work that, that's that's impressive titling to me. I remember when they first announced it and everyone's like is it tears of the kingdom is it tears we're being torn apart trying to figure this out and they had to come out and actually yeah. explain it. it is tears everybody mm-hmm. oh man uh, yeah let's see <clears throat> what is the best name i mean there's it's a year of a lot of sequels right so it's a lot of anything that doesn't have a number at the end yes. automatically shoots yes 100 percent. Right? yep 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 yeah i think, I think uh okay. sequel naming is the most boring thing possible i i know that we all got sick of colons and hyphens in the names of our video games but maybe we should maybe we should need a little bit more subtitles it turns out actually like the game of the year nominees the the game awards all have a number at the end and right. uh that's a little weird just feels a little weird yeah yeah uh, yeah. I, you know, Pizza Tower. Pizza Tower is the best. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. That's why I a couple other ones just for just names. Yeah, Crime O'Clock. 
<laughs> oh, that's incredible. <laughs> right? I, mean, I don't know what that is, that but rules. I'm in. Gun, gunbrella. Gunbrella. Yeah, gun Immediately. Under my gunbrella. Yeah. Ella, Ella. I know, hey, right? Hey. <laughs> that is good. Cassette piece? Cassette piece is good. It's no gumbrella, but it's good. It's good. I think that's all I have. Oh, uh, really. I like, uh, um, <laughs> I, I was thinking uh, Dredge, I think is a really good name. I had Dredge on there name. too, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's strong. Yeah, that's yep, yep. Um, There's one called Pronti. Excuse me? I don't know what it even is, but I was just looking yeah. at it on the list of... I do like the name Thirsty Suitors. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Great. We oh, yeah. about the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think Long actually overdue. that's I'm a lot. Sick of that guy. Yeah. <laughs> that's Excited on my wish list. Words, yeah. I can't wait to play that game. Damn it. That is good. Uh, there's also, I don't know if you all caught this game. I think it released in the summer. It's a game that uh, basically compiles a bunch of games that look like little fake games and like in ads for games where it's like, oh, you got to drag this thing over here. You have to. Oh, that's right. I remember it, this. I remember yes. this. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And so it's a bunch. I, I, how do you define this, Nathan, for like it's I mean, it's commercials you see for games, but you know that's that not, not actually what the game like plays. Those games actually are, right? Yes. Yeah, but the those name little, of like, this. Ads that you see all over social media where it's like, here's this game and it's got this like weird, bizarre cutscene that is not representative at all. Yes. Yeah, so the made, ads. yeah. Yeah. And so somebody made a game out of these ads, essentially. It's a compilation mm. and the game is called. Yeah, exclamation point. You want those games, right? So here you go. Now, let's see you clear them. <laughs> that's the full yeah. name of that Ooh, game. That's, a that's great, it. That yeah. wins. Okay. Yeah, best okay. title of the year. There it yep. is. Also, Goobies. Not Goobies? <laughs> Runner yeah. up. Goobies. Uh, Slick James writes in. They say, hey, everybody. What's the most memorable battle you've ever had in an RPG? Come I mean, It's tough. I actually, I have to say, I didn't e even like the story of Final Fantasy 16, but I'll literally never forget when you go to space and punch a dragon in the face. Yes. Like, yeah. Yes. What the hell? So <laughs> good. Thank you, Kita, for standing up for 16. My jaw was oh, like dropped the moment I was like, I realized we're going to go to space. I was like, he is blasting off and <laughs> the logic dictates that I am going to follow him into outer space. And, and I did. And it was part, fantastic. It's so good then because and like you know 20 minutes later you're just running around some stupid town again like doing side quests for kids and it's like yeah. i was just in space punching a dragon i don't have time for your little side quest anymore kids hey, i feel like know? this is akin to um i think like this is akin to when you like come back from some like life-changing event or trip or whatever and then you're just like cleaning your toilet or something and you're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah that's right mm -hmm. yeah no i got married this year and we like got married we had two wedding ceremonies so it was a whole weekend full of nuptials so we got back and we came back to our same little crappy apartment in brooklyn and i was like here we are where there's a leaky ceiling and my cat is mad at me welcome home <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i it's it's too ambiguous but i'm like it's got to be Probably some Elite Four fight in Pokemon. Maybe like Pokemon Silver's Elite Four fight. Like, I feel like so many of those fights, not current era Elite Four Janet, where they, you know, basically just kill their Pokemon and they commit suicide For and make you automatically win. Yeah, that was a very version, I had a face of disdain. You did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But back in the day when it was like, it felt like a real challenge and it really felt like you were just barely squeaking by. But is it, can that be your most memorable if you yourself can't really That's the question. It? That's the question. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. taking myself out of this competition because I can't remember the specific details For of me, it. it's, you know, you know, I, get spoilers for Kingdom Hearts One, a very old game that I'm barely playing now, Ansem Riku, man. I don't know what's what that final boss is yet, so like, don't at me about it. But that Ansem Riku fight changed me <laughs> in ways that I miss who I was before I played that day. You know, wow, yeah, like fair. it's just so hard. That's basically it. Uh, that's like, what it like, is. what's okay. so big a deal about the fight? It's incredibly, incredibly hard. That's it. Yeah, I remember there being a lot of very annoying fights in the first yeah. two Kingdom Hearts games. Even as I like loved them when I was a kid, but you know, they did like annoy me. Um, I feel like my most memorable one is the final boss fight in. Uh, oh God, what game is that? Uh, Describe it. We'll get it. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, oh, Golden Sun. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, fun. Yeah, I Golden Sun on Game Boy Advance. <laughs> um, and it was just memorable for me because it was one where it was just like one of those knockdown drag out fights where you're not sure you're going to win. Yeah. And like you think like, oh, man, I've got maybe one turn left in me before like this thing finishes me. Yep. And that's what happened to me. Like the, the fight for me took like 30 or 45 minutes in my recollection. I could be wrong about this because, again, I was a child um, and I was like, 
playing it in the back seat of like the car when my mom was driving me somewhere or like driving me home. And I just remember like getting out of the car, uh, like my party on its last legs again, like one turn left, probably not going to win, probably gonna have to do all of this all over again, which is going to be a horrible pain. And then struck the final blow and won. I was like, yeah. Nice. And like, it was great too. Cause I had this like sword that basically was a cut scene unto itself. Every time that it like attacked, it would play <laughs> this whole f-ing, like thing where there was, I don't know, like fire or light or whatever raining down from the sky. So it was also cool as hell. Yeah. And I was like, I am a God <laughs> again in my like f-ing prepubescent voice. Cause I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was a, that was a good boss fight. That's perfect. I got to go giant oh, Roomba nice. from like a dragon. Oh, Ooh, yes. recent, but Love good. Giant yeah. Giant Roomba is excellent. Uh, let's see. Uh, Paulo writes in and says, I have very limited experience with comic books. Gita, is your podcast 52 Pickup a good place to try to jump into that hobby? Is there anything one should review as homework beforehand? You could review a whole bunch of stuff, but my co- my uh, co-host on the podcast, Alex Jaffe, frequently says to me that the best place to start with comics is just jump right in in the middle. The reason for that is because these are long-running universes that have been going continuously, in the case of DC, since like the 1940s. There is no beginning for you. Yeah. Unless you want to go read some stuff that is like more difficult to parse. If you think you want to get some recent thing before um, specifically 52, I would read Gotham Central because it's really easy to get into. It is like a procedural set in Gotham in the Gotham Police Department. But it's also the introduction of one of the best characters of all time, Renee Montoya, who is, uh, she was in the beginning of 52, she has already left the force because the Joker was in love with her and outed her publicly. She's one of the first out gay characters in the DC universe. And she just rocks. She's just like a, a super cool Latina detective. And her story in 52 is my favorite arc of the whole book, which is a pretty tall order because it's also got Booster Gold in it, one of the best characters ever made, um, in my opinion, personal opinion. But 52 is a great jumping off point if you don't want to do any homework. If you are the kind of person that, that would rather just dive right in, which I think is really the key for most people, 52 is the origin of... Uh, it's like it's what made the rock go so insane that he needed to reorient the <laughs> the warner brothers discovery studio in order to play black adam like that's 100 percent serious it wow. is also where uh batwoman uh, the kate came back woman comes from so that that her first appearance is in 52 it's some of the best stories for the question and renee montoya uh alex like a question super fan and it's an incredible, great, pulpy, noir mystery they have going on. And it's all these stories without having to get into all the baggage of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman who right. don't appear in the comic at all. So it is just like a fun story where a lot of, they assume a lot of the other readers will also won't know who these third stringers are. And that's kind of the point. So uh, we are, you could treat our, our podcast like a book club, I think, but there is no ideal jumping on point and that's like the point of comic books so okay so help me out so 52 pickup is this the new 52 dc reboot Uh, you got to help me out so that was what like 2012 or whatever 52 comes after the crisis crossover event infinite crisis which was happened in the early 2000s i remember because i was still in high school and also reading live journal at the time that's how i can place everything in my mind so infinite crisis was one of those things where they're using an editorial event to actually sort of cover up the fact that they are like rearranging the universe and and like rearranging the multiverse and some behind the scenes character stuff so after that all the books premiered from there um, they're, they're, that's where the new 52 of books sort right. of comes from. Right. But 52, the comic book, was a comic book series that was supposed to explain what happened between the end of Infinite Crisis and the beginning of this new 52, which would all take place one year later. Oh. Um, 52 doesn't do that. <laughs> they this, The writers on that book just decided not to do that at all. They just tell their own great story. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. That explains a little better. Um. And I hate to put you on the spot like this, but Booster Gold, um, I feel like that's a name that I've has been, 
every once in a while people drop it there's always like oh they're making a booster gold tv show or movie like what's the current plan yeah. they're gonna do something with it now uh, james gunn is uh trying to put booster gold in the new dc extended universe and okay. the last booster gold extended media news i heard was right before a amazing show legends of tomorrow was canceled donald Faison was cast as booster gold which i'm so upset that i can't see that yeah. But he's this incredible character. He's born from like the hyper capitalist culture of the 80s where he is his story is that he's from the future and is like a down on his luck scammer who goes and steals an outfit from a superhero museum and then goes back in time to make it rich with his prior knowledge of the future. Oh, that's and good. It's a great character because he's always in it for himself and you get to learn, you watch him learn how to be selfless. And so you also get into some fun time travel stuff, which is always like a weakness for me. Yeah, yeah. But this story that follows him in 52 is like a prime example. And I also would say 52 invented the way that Rip Hunter is portrayed in Legends of Tomorrow, which is as a, a guy who's been driven insane by time, time travel shenanigans. So. Right. A lot of cross media things like emerging out of this book because the ideas were just so good. It's like a powerhouse of four of the top DC writers working on this together. And the book ran weekly, which is absolutely wild. Like that doesn't happen because making a comic book is extremely hard. So it's it's just worth your time to read it. Please yeah. listen to my podcast where I gush about it constantly. <laughs> there we go. 52 pickups. Yeah, name of the podcast. Just listen to 52 pickup. There it's we go. 52, pick 52 pickup. It's on aftermath.site. Subscribe. Hell yeah. Thank you. Hell yeah. Hey Siri, subscribe to, <laughs> to 52 pickup. <laughs> we are yeah. on iTunes and wherever else you will find your podcast. Probably as literally says. anywhere else. Even yeah. like if you like have a rock you look under to find podcasts, it's there too. That's it. I don't uh, know how you find podcasts under there, but we put our podcasts yeah. there too. Uh, it's interesting talking <laughs> about like just newcomers getting into comic books and stuff. Cause like I've, I've always been kind of a dabbler in comic books. Like I've, I've read the biggies, you know, like, okay, Dark Knight Returns, you guys are Watchmen Sam, yeah. and all that stuff. But it's interesting. Like I was trying to um, introduce my wife to Watchmen like before we watched the show. And it's so interesting seeing like a complete newcomer it's kind of like when you hand a controller to somebody for the first time where like her big takeaway she's like i really like this and like i want to read sandman but like i i just don't know what to read first in the panels like it's all yeah. so confusing to me with these layouts of like what what order is this supposed to be in because sometimes it's really tough to tell and it's like it's, it's so it, true yeah <laughs> i it's, mean it's a weird thing for newcomers to try and wrap their minds around but i still struggle with it sometimes it's just a dabble no, you know especially going back and forth between manga and american comics mm. i get so confused so easily i end up reading something backwards by accident yeah i it's what's helped I mean, you just have to do it a lot, right? Like, yeah. the comics teach you how to read them. But panel layouts, especially, like, there's just, like, so many writers. I, there's this great example of a, a monologue that I think a lot of people really like in an X-Men comic where the entire page is just a speech bubble that goes back and forth. That's pretty cool. But when I look at that, my reaction as a comic book reader is, my homie, you needed to write a book. You were trying to write a book <laughs> <laughs> a comic book. <laughs> The best writers and artists work together to create really natural flows. Grant Morrison is a great example of that. Yeah. They use really wild layouts a lot. And they still read very naturally, especially because they tend to do that when a lot of things are happening concurrently. So your eyes can just jump all over the page. But not everyone is operating at that high level. Yeah, I think of um, like the Court of Owls storyline. I think like when Batman's kind of like lost in the maze, they do cool stuff too, where like the text starts going sideways yeah. and like disorients you more and more as you go through it as he's also confused. Good yeah, stuff. I love stuff like that where it, it's using the medium in order to put you in the mindset of the character. Yep. I think um, Grant Morrison's Arkham Asylum, Mysterious House and Serious Earth also does a really like a really good job with that. Yeah, I'm a Morrison fan person. So. Love it, love it. <laughs> They're my fave. Uh, Chandler writes in, uh, speaking of art, they say, how many human lives is the Mona Lisa worth? Oh, God. Mm. That's not what I thought this question was. <laughs> Zero. No, yeah, is it one? Yeah. I'm, to, it's I'm, painting. I'm feeling care. that way, too. One random yeah, person I would totally problem the Mona Lisa in a heartbeat. I would, too. Yeah. Just instantly. I'd have 100 trains run over it. I don't care. We have pictures of it. <laughs> like, we're fine. Let we it go. We lose yeah. art by hand over fist every single year. I mean, I think yeah. video games is actually a really good example of that. Preservation in video games, when you talk to people that work in preservation, they will tell you that one, most of the materials that you need to archive are under lock and key. Luke, again, wrote a great blog about this and just in terms of video game art that's on Aftermath. Yeah. That's right. an incredible headline too. It's like a most video game art will never be seen. 
Yeah, yeah it's like it has a. It's because it's owned corporately. But even stuff in the world of fine arts, it, paintings get damaged and lost and stolen constantly. We are always losing art, and to put art, a, a, a some a physical object over a human life, I just have a hard time doing that. As much as I love yeah. art, uh, I mean, you know, I will say that like uh, preservation of these things is important. Um, and it's a real there. There was that study from the, what the Video Game History Foundation this yeah. year about how like. Uh, what percentage of it or of games are like currently unavailable? It's like three, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like in the seventies or eighties. Like, yeah. So most of them, the the lion's share, yeah. um, that's terrible. And like that is something that you know collectively as an industry, as a medium, we should be focusing on. We should be making sure that games are more widely available. More things should be open source. More things should be free or like otherwise accessible if rights expire or whatever else. Like yeah, you know, this is not how things should work. Yeah. But um, you know. And I'm kind of surprised that I have to say this. Uh, human lives are still more important than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. And by the way, uh, we apologize to Kelsey Lewin, who's listening. Uh, the study was 87% of all that's gone. I think she, she wrote that up. But sorry, yeah, Leo. Which you're, is, Leo, you're going to say sacrifice I, some large country just to, for the sake of the Mona Lisa? Or? I'm going to give the only other ethical answer, which is I will sacrifice myself for the Mona Lisa. Wow. Whoa. Yeah, that's, that's okay. looking at it. You would can't you, ask going, oh, anyone nice. else to do you know, it for you. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they they say that's the one thing that will make her smile. <laughs> oh, Leo. You sacrifice yourself for the Mona Lisa, she will smile. <laughs> Leo, would you really do that? Would you really do that? <laughs> no. Okay, good. What, what do you mean? Like Mona Lisa. Lisa. I think some people other would. paintings I would do it for. Really? Right? I, you know, I'd sacrifice myself if it came to Van Gogh self portrait. Whoa, okay. that's, a, that's a piece of art oh. that has affected me really deeply. Um, if, it, if they were going to tear down the Rothko Chapel in West Texas, I would absolutely stand in front of that bulldozer. Yeah, I'd do that for me, though. You can't. I would never pull the trolley problem lever on someone else. <laughs> Only myself. <laughs> I guess if for Double Fine Psych Odyssey, I'd probably. Yeah, I'd take that trolley to the head. Uh, if it meant yeah. preserving that, wow. I think. Yeah. Wait, what is and the then, size of this trolley? Is it like a really small one that only hits your head? Yeah. No, it's wow. not a San Francisco trolley. It's a trolley that's like from a functioning country with good public transportation, where it's just going <laughs> to steamroll <laughs> you. Uh, Jacob Benedict writes in and says, Hey, Min Maxinistas. Sure. Uh, a few years back, a few hey, friends man. and I got into Age of Empires. All right, now you're talking my language. But nobody had hey, any hey. similar experience, or no, no, nobody had any experience with RTSs, and it led to us forming our own meta that was constantly shifting as we learned to play Age of Empires. To this day, it's the most fun I've had with an RTS. Do y'all have any similar experiences with learning a game with your friends that maybe wouldn't have hit as hard if you'd been stuck learning with randoms online? Oh, man. I, I mean, my direct parallel to that is that when I was a kid, me and my cousin used to play Warcraft 2. Yeah. Um, and we would just like enable cheats and make our own maps. So we just created these massively lopsided scenarios where we could not lose. Um, and we're like, because I, I feel like the fun of that game to me, or like a, a rewarding mechanic that wasn't really supposed to be so like, so, so much of a centerpiece of anything that you were doing, was like when you had levels where, you know, you'd start out with like your main army, and then there'd be allies that you could like, uh, find elsewhere on the map, like a whole other army, like a different colored one, and you go, could go find them, then they would like join your forces. Yep. I loved that. I loved the feeling of that. So I'd create so many maps where like that was most of what you did. You just like walked over to where somebody else was and you're like, okay, now they've joined your forces. And now let's go massacre the incredibly small army that I made that's the <laughs> enemy forces. That's perfect. They've never stood a chance to begin with and now they super don't stand a chance. <laughs> you know, I, I do think RTSs are, are a great one for this category. I think fighting games is, is the other one. Like having a friend yeah. who's learning a fighting game with you and just going toe to toe over and over again and not worrying about the online scene, that yeah. just, that changes Good everything. Lord. It's so much better. You know, for me, it's uh, me and my pals over the pandemic started having every Thursday night, we'd get together on a Discord call and just play games together. And I, at, during that time, I got really, really into playing Overwatch and now Overwatch 2 with my friends Nico and Tyler. And uh, the game, if you try to play it without friends, is not in a state where I'd recommend that experience to people. But playing with Nico and Tyler, Tyler specifically, who are having like high level conversations about why the game sucks now <laughs> while we are playing is, I think, some of the most intellectually stimulating experiences that I had. <laughs> Just like dissecting like all the bad choices Blizzard has made with the game. But, like when the game hits, like when you get a really good fight, and you're playing with friends that are communicating with each other, you can still get that good sort of like raid puzzle feeling of Overwatch. But yeah. 
I think the like the Roadhog rework is like a great example of this. Everybody's getting reworked to work with how fast the game is and also to give everyone more utility as a shooter. So now Roadhog is all about trapping and shotgunning instead of the cool other non-shooting abilities that they have. And the game is like a worse version of a character shooter that I could play and from many other different developers that make better shooters. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gwenko writes in, they say, Aftermath Riley uh, posted an interesting piece on the Game Awards that highlighted something that's bothered me for a while. Well, the Game Awards having a best independent game category, or with the Game Awards having a best independent game category, there's pretty much no chance for an indie to win or even be nominated for Game of the Year. In that way, it reminds me of the Academy's treatment of its best animated feature category. I know there's a lot of factors at play, but what do you think developers and the press can do to put indies in the same light as AAAs when it comes to awards like the Game Awards? I mean, this is also funny because technically uh, an, an indie game is nominated for Game of the Year. Um, that one that Baldur's Gate. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is uh, technically indie. Of- Meanwhile, Dave the Diver is technically not an indie game, and it is nominated for Indie Game of the Year. Yeah. So Game Awards yeah. did not really do their due diligence here, or it speaks more to how much indie or independent game doesn't really mean anything at this That's point. The also, there are a lot of like quote-unquote independent publishers like Devolver, is that an indie game? Is that not an indie game? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Um, I talked to some indie developers for an article about this very question, like, what is an indie game? Is there an indie games bubble? Like, what are, what, what are we talking about here when we talk about indie games? Something that Victoria Tran, um, who works for uh, the Among Us people, yeah. told me uh, I, is, like, the distinctions don't really make a difference to the audience. One, like she said, uh, if I was trying to buy a car... And someone told me that this car is like from a really cool like uh, um, a car company that is all worker owned and you sell these bespoke parts. Like her answer, her question would still be, OK, but which car do I drive? <laughs> like I need to drive a car. <laughs> but also like uh, a lot of things are indie that we don't think of as indie. Right. All those like uh, games that just like swipe other people's assets, asset flips on Uh, that are full and the app store is full of those are all technically indie developers a lot of the time what we're talking about is an aesthetic difference which means like an art style or like they don't come from a major studio that has that is publicly traded and has investors and a lot of backing you know that that's usually what we mean like in the case of dave the diver to me that's just like an aesthetic difference people saw pixel art pixel art means indie game and that's what it becomes yeah Mm -hmm. yeah it it, it, to me like you know, you say the Game Awards didn't do their homework. It's a, I think it's, I mean, we're in the nominating pool. Like, it's everybody in the jury pool who's nominating this stuff. And mm-hmm. it's everybody who's not doing their homework. Like, especially with the category of, like, best debut indie game. It's like, the, some of those that are category like, is so hard. Because you just, you just end up Googling, what, you think of an indie game you like, and then yeah. you just look up, is this your first game? Right, right. Yeah. And sometimes the answer right. is, like, kind. Of, yeah. but then I mean, like the Grammys don't even do it by actual debut for their best debut artist anymore, right? Really, it's, it's not, yeah, no, like a lot of the people no. in that get nominated for the Grammy for best debut artist have been working for years, like, yes, artists that I love, <laughs> like, suddenly get nominated for best debut, and I know they have three other albums, yeah. you know, it's yeah. it is about the audience perception rather than is this an accurate description of the work at hand, yeah, well, I mean, perception's mm-hmm. reality, and I think yeah. the for better or worse it seems that the Game Awards has decided that they lean on just, like, what do the results say? Like, if the results yeah. say Sifu's a fighting game, then Sifu's a fighting game. If the results <laughs> right. say Dave the Diver's <laughs> an indie <laughs> game, then it's an indie game. If the results say that, okay, well, maybe a lot of people do think Baldur's Gate 3 is an indie game, but but they know it'll get nominated for other things, so they maybe chose just not to put it in there. It's like, that's... Right. Oh, yeah, that's that would within have been your... crushing a bunch of other games. Yep. Yeah, 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 that's within... Exactly, that's within their right to do so if people choose to vote that way. But, like, yeah, that is some of the you know, bias or behind the scenes meta that happens with this. And I don't think it'll ever be perfect because inherently if you have like, and we talked about this earlier, right? Like lists are always going to be like just a condensed little thing that you kind of came up with. Like it's not going to be able to exemplify and encompass an entire year of content. But I guess to bring back to the question, like what can we do to get indies into more of a spotlight, which people in the chat did point out, like Hades getting nominated for game of the year, like in 20... 20. 20, 20, 2020. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think ultimately yeah. you just have to play more. And that's like, and I say that fully knowing that I'm part of the problem. Like I, you know, like to Ben's point, like lots of us vote in it. And it's like, yeah, like a lot of times I might not get to a really incredible indie game if a lot of my peers didn't also get to it and also write about it. So I think at the end of the day, if 
anyone wants indies to get more of a spotlight, you have to go in to Steam or Itch, itch or wherever and do the work of trying to find and surface what those gems are and then shout about them and more people will play them. And that's how like yeah. the big hit indies end up being hit indies. It's like the noise was so loud that a lot of us did end up checking out Dredge or, you know, again, not indie game debate indie get whatever. David, David Ever was one of those. And yeah, that's man. why yeah. it was, in, you know, so like it's always going to be about that. Like it always will be a popularity contest because it kind of is like I always joke that my game of the year is not really the game of the year. It's the best game that I happen to have played in that year. Like there's probably yeah, a game that I like uh, more, but I just didn't get to, yep. you know, yeah. like yep. that's just yeah. the reality. So, you know, yeah, yeah. your best. I, I think that also like, it's worth pointing out that with the game awards specifically, like that's never going to be a vehicle for independent games or for smaller games. It's never going to yeah. be a place that really, you know, like fully focuses on them. I mean, the game awards is primarily, you know, a place where a bunch of trailers for big name games and maybe a few indies get debuted. And like, yeah. that's always what it's going to be. That will be its purpose. Yeah. And like the thing that will help indies more um, is just more infrastructure specifically around indies. There's already already some really good like indie shows and things like that that happen around the same time as like Summer Games Fest and things of that yeah. nature. We need um, an IFC that. awards that will yeah. will run corollary as a corollary to the yeah. game awards. You know, and, you like, know, there, there's some of that with like GDC. I think, and with, yeah. uh, you know, the uh, with Indiecade and things like that. So you get some. But, you know, there just needs to be more focus put on those things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, more coverage of those things, too. From yeah. us. That's yeah. exactly it. I mean, people are always like, oh, the Game Awards, they shouldn't have reveal trailers. It should just be pure awards. It's like, that's a fair argument. But is anybody watching the Dice Awards? Is anybody watching the GDC Awards? Yeah. You're not watching it for that reason. The Golden Joysticks, right? That right. was literally last week. Yep. You know, yeah. like it, it's in the UK. So a weird time. But it was something that happens that is also yeah. like all the peers, all these developer peers getting together to try to determine who really deserves to get their flowers this year. And we should pay more attention. We should not just come out for just, Ke just Jeff Keighley, right? <laughs> Jeff Keighley <laughs> takes up a lot of space, but that's partially because we all show up for him. And right. we should start showing up for other things too. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair to Keighley, and we're always interested in being very fair to Mr. Jeff Keighley. Like, mm -hmm. I do think that they're trying. Like, they do put, you know, indie games, let them have the reveals on that show. And, like, having the yeah. two categories of best independent game and best debut game from an indie team is also trying to highlight more. And looking at, like, the history of the Game Awards and specifically. Games for Impact. No, yeah, exactly. Just the get code, some more the names code, out there. The urban, the urban. It's album an interesting of one. The Game Awards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like you know, since the Game Awards started, for just Game of the Year, uh, that category alone, yeah, there was Stray last year was in the running, which is pretty wild. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Hades in 2020. Celeste was in there. Inside yeah. was in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Con Control, if you want to count that, a 505 published it. I guess you know it's a little bit confusing. You know, but. Remedy to me is a double A studio punching above their weight, so I'll I'll give it I'll give it to them. Okay. But I, I do think that something really useful Keeley does is elevate these games to be talked about on the same level yes. as the biggest yeah. releases of the year, yep. right? Because it will also be true, like something that the games press, I don't think really accurately reflects all the time is that a lot of people only ever play one video game every year, basically. Yeah. They get one game and they're completely obsessed with it. And while most of the time, those people are people who play like Madden or Call of Duty or FIFA or something like that, there's a lot of people who say, who say things like, oh, I'm not a gamer. But I've just 100% hit Hades like three times in a yes, row. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and it's like, no, you definitely are. Yeah. You just are a Hades-specific gamer, you know? Right. And they they do deserve to see their favorite games talked about and celebrated on the same level as the next big release from Naughty Dog. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, Michael Baker writes in, they say, what's your favorite reality television program to watch in 2023? Oh, my God. Best reality TV yeah. show. This I watched is, so I mean, much of this garbage. Oh, really? Like, I was I was like trying to think about it because I, I feel like <clears throat> a lot of reality TV shows I used to like a lot and they just kind of got old. Like I was into Love is Blind for a while, but that format is just tired at this point. Same with The Circle. Um, same with Too Hot to Handle. Like all those shows wow. just got kind of tired. Really doing it. Okay. Um, but uh, Physical 100, that show debuted this year. It's like a Korean reality TV show. It's like a competition right. where it's about like people with like the best bodies in all of Korea compete in all of these different physical challenges. Um, it and sounds like fascinating. Oh my yeah. God. And like when they say best, they don't even just mean like one time. They, they don't just mean like super chiseled rip people either. They, they often mean that, but not all the time. Um, and so it's really interesting to like <laughs> see this reflection on both like different body types and how that all fits into, you know, uh, definitions of athleticism 
And then also just like to watch these people, for example, like the first challenge is them like having to hang from a bar for as long yeah, as possible. That's what I'm looking at right that's now. Yeah. Have to, like, yeah, do that. like a hundred people at once are just hanging up there and like slowly <laughs> oh, dropping, man. which also takes a psychological toll on you. You like see people start to drop and like, oh, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Um, it, it's really compelling. It's very, very good. I highly Me recommend it. trying to do one pull up. Oh, I don't know if <laughs> yeah, I exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I got really. Did you know that the YouTube channel Film Rise has put all of the episodes of Iron Chef on YouTube? Oh. Because I discovered that when my husband started going to grad school and I was alone in the apartment a lot of the time. Perfect. Uh, Iron Chef is this reality TV show from Japan that used to run on the Food Network like before oh, yeah. all of the bigger food competition shows. Like food competition shows are my specific reality show weakness. Kitchen Nightmares came back and yeah. I Oh, it's so good. It's so just, like <laughs> like exploitative and terrible but it's also like give me that garbage i need it amy's need baking Gordon company Randy. come back please yeah yes god um but iron chef is amazing because they haven't quite figured out the formula of how to make this reality show work but also they are so much more performative and extravagant one of my favorite episodes has this intro where the chairman of the iron chef competition who is just an actor who's created a character uh goes in and he says uh he tells a little story but when they're they introduce the competitor who goes up against the three Jap the iron chefs uh, iron chef japan iron chef Italy, Iron Chef France, and Iron Chef China, who are all Japanese people who have just mastered the culinary techniques of those regions. Anyway, there was one competition where like an Italian guy who lives in Japan was was coming and they came up with this ridiculous, definitely false yarn about the the rebel Italians of Japanese cooking who who were all there in the audience making a huge ruckus rooting for their fellow Italians. They're the bad boys of chefs and culinary <laughs> like culture in Japan. <laughs> And it's it's trying so hard to do something that now reality TV does so effortlessly. Um, but it's it's just so fascinating, especially like they can, they did not figure out the food photography yet. Like the food looks horrible. Perfect. <laughs> Every single Perfect. episode <laughs> looks like slop. I just love it. <laughs> now wait, is this the uh, is this like the revival they did in the early in the early two no. thousands, or is this the OG. original original? This is the OG okay. Iron Chef. Good. Is yeah. that the only good one? No, they, it like, is. got a new chairman later, and I don't like him. No, he tries too he's, hard. He's not. The thing about the original chairman, like one, he's always dressed like a drag queen. Positive, and two, he bites the know? onion every oh time. Oh my god, yeah. he straight up bites straight into an onion. He is yeah. like he's doing straight straight drag. Like it's incredible. He's always covered in sequins, and he just seems like he's that flamboyant. He's like a Sailor Moon villain, actually. That's what oh, I'm trying okay. to say. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, <laughs> he really just feels like he's bringing that like gay straight man energy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember I, my dad VHS taping classic Iron Chef, and I was watching it together as a as a young kid. Oh wow, yeah, classic. That's, that's awesome. No, my whole family got together every every time it was on Food Network. But we just got hooked, like. It is. They are all really, really accomplished chefs, but it is like a ridiculous manufactured spectacle and the Iron Chef always wins. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know I talk about it too much, mainly on Party Chat, our bonus podcast, but I every episode of Survivor I watch, I always end up just saying, why, why aren't more people talking about Survivor? This show is so damn good. And genuinely, like the highlight of my week is after an episode of Survivor airs, going to the Survivor subreddit because like it is hopping it's popping everybody is in there talking about like game design and game theory and yeah, social I politics say, the people are really into the gamesmanship of that one yes. I, had a fan, or I had a friend when i was living in uh, virginia who was like one of those people and it was like really tapped into the community of people who like try to get on the show so okay. that's the other part is like people start solving the games <laughs> and then they like use that as a means to get on the show like when yep. they get interviewed for it and stuff they're like oh yeah i can do this one i can beat that one i've been training for years to do this um, and so it's like a whole circuit people run. It's this wild, crazy thing. But yep. Survivor yep. fans are bonkers. They are they are crazy people. And I'm here to tell you they're crazy, but they're right. Like it is yeah. that fascinating of a show and we should be talking about it more. I mean, the easy pitch is just, uh, you know how it's kind of exciting and wild when a character dies, like in a show like Game of Thrones. It, that's every week on Survivor. It's just a big group of people that you care about on an island and every week somebody's going down and it's going to be fascinating how it happens and the ramifications of that. It is right. the best show. 
Have you seen this season? I started watching this, and I, Dave, my husband David really hates reality TV, and I think he's right about his reasons for hating reality TV, but I love it, so I, I often start things and then fall off it. Um, but the season where filmmaker and showrunner for White Lotus, Mike White, yes. is just on the show, <laughs> yes. and it's like, it's before we started having this conversation in like American culture, it is an entire season of, of Survivor where it's people who grew up and live in poverty versus people who are more privileged and grew up and wow. live in, in like economic wealth. And it's like, I don't know how they were on that cultural tip before the rest of us got there, but Mike White's there. And he's like, I'm not qualified. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was weird, especially then when White Lotus blew up and like people were sharing old clips of him like drinking wine on the island and being really sassy and stuff. <laughs> I was like, this is the White Lotus guy? It's so weird. Yeah. And yeah. like he just wanted to be on it because he's also a super fan of Survivor. <laughs> yep, he is. And now he like talks to Jeff Probst, the, the host and producer of Survivor, to like help outline, you know, future events and they bounce ideas off each other and stuff. That's so he has cool. a wild influence on Survivor in this day and age, which is weird. Also, oh, wow. uh, on the Survivor podcast, the official Survivor podcast that Jeff Probst hosts, um, he is fascinating because like when they're coming up with new ideas for challenges and idols, yada, yada, and Survivor, he talks a lot about how he talks to the creator of Exploding Kittens. I forget their name. Huh. Yeah, but he's always bouncing ideas off them for like designing new Survivor challenges. And like, is this fair? How many, like, what's the number? What should be the ratio? What should be the percentage wow. chance this happens? And I guess like that's his consultant for game design these days. Yeah, Survivor is a video game. Okay, case closed. <laughs> well, it is. They did release a Survivor video game this year that for some reason I have not tried yet, but it's uh, supposed to be quite bad. Uh, let's see. Loud Eel writes in and they say, did you know that Serial Vasquez, uh, former uh, min-maxer here, uh, did you know that Serial Vasquez, uh, Vasquez's podcast, Every Week I'm in Tears, um, is on episode 26 of talking about Tears of the Kingdom and he's almost ready to fight Ganondorf? I just wanted to know how I can get my refund for the Tears of the Kingdom deepest dive for not being the best, <laughs> most thorough discussion about Tears of the Kingdom on wow. the internet. Uh, in all seriousness, shout out to Serial for his incredible resolve and in sticking with it and completing every other Zelda game this year. That is uh, bananas. Wow. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Every week I'm in tears. If you want to hear Serial Vasquez, go deep on Zelda and Tears of the Kingdom. Um, Dan from Canada writes in and says, do you have an episode of a podcast that you've listened to the most? Hmm. Oh my God. I always go back I to do. top tens, etc. Also, the episode of Rewatchables on the movie Spotlight or Social Network. <laughs> it's oh, funny man. just listening to the Rewatchables okay. um, on Social so Network. I, Those are two fascinating movies. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, am a, I am a fanatic for the podcast uh, You're Wrong About, which is a, a great a, podcast. Yep, an incredible podcast. Um, they do like deep dives into kind of cultural misconceptions of various things, usually centering around like, you know, the time period of like, anywhere between like the sixties and the nineties. Like, so basically, you know, what is formative for culture now? And they have this really, really good episode on homelessness and how it works and how it functions. Um, and also efforts that the United States, a country that generally doesn't do much in this regard, um, has made to try to stop it, um, and solve it. And in various places has been essentially successful. Um, specifically in like Salt Lake city, Utah, they had this effort, um, where they're basically like, we're going to solve homelessness. Um, and so they didn't solve it exactly, <clears throat> but they cut way down on it. There was like a 70% reduction in homelessness mm. while they were funding this program. But because they had all of this propaganda around the idea of solving it specifically, they're like, well, it didn't solve it. So we should just give up forever. And so they stopped. And like the episode of the, the this episode of the podcast ends up being this really good rumination on the way that like in America, especially we have this fixation on solving problems as opposed to doing the kind of, you know, unsexy work of just maintenance over time yep. of saying, no, yep. we just have to like, there will always be homelessness. There will always be homeless people. But if we put money into this, if we create spaces where people can, you know, have shelter and whatnot, um, and also like give people money so they can get back on their feet, then we will solve a lot of the issues associated with that problem, or at least like cut down on it. And that's what we got to be doing over and over and over for all of these major issues that we have in this country. And we even have done it before and basically accomplished it, but we gave up because it wasn't the way we were like, no, not like that. Right. right, right. Yeah. That's yeah. the story of America. What's, yeah. the, yep. what's the name of the podcast again? Uh, you're wrong about. There we go. 
They also yeah. cover like lighter pop culture stuff. Like their episodes on Princess Diana, I think are really. Oh, they're really so great. good. Their oh, Princess yeah. Diana episodes are like better than you know the Crown or whatever. I mean, yeah, I was watching the Crown concurrently with listening to that. I got swept up in Princess Die fever like <laughs> many many years late. But I I think that they go in depth into how people were actually talking about her at the time, mm. which is something that is difficult to really remember now that we are more aware of everything that she was enduring. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, and, um, my answer was actually going to be Just King Things. <laughs> I love this podcast, Just King Things, which is about oh, yeah. my two friends, Michael Lutz and Cameron Kunzelman, read every single book by Stephen King in publication order. And it's it's fantastic because like the method does work. Stephen King is such like a naturalistic writer. He really writes just like straight off. He and like and like Lil Wayne are very similar in this way where they don't pre-think <laughs> everything. It just comes from the dome. You know, they don't write anymore. <laughs> they just say things. And really, the method really works because you can watch King discover things about himself and his work throughout this. And I also think that it really illuminates some of the books that people would tell you are the weaker entries in the Stephen King oeuvre. And for me, the episode on the Tommyknockers, which is a book that a lot of Stephen King fans say is the worst Stephen King book. <laughs> yeah. They go in and they're like, straight up, we think this is like so much better than what everyone thinks it is. And Ooh, we I love should it. read it right away. Yeah, like I, I went and I read it and it's like, if you read it with the knowledge of everything that came before and like everything that he was working through and understand it as a novel about addiction and his own reaction to sobriety and the experience of trying to recover from that but keep your creative drive it makes complete sense and it's kind of a masterpiece and yeah it's got some of his, stri- his strongest writing in it i went back and i did actually start reading it I and i it. was like oh my god they're completely right Nothing's better than a podcast when people find the secret masterpieces, you know, like the blank check podcast. That's always a big thing. It's like, oh, when there's a film that, oh, this was actually their secret masterpiece the whole time. It's like, all right, that's just catnip for me. Yeah, no, Sam, I love uh, becoming a super fan by watching someone else explore something for me, (laughs) basically. Yep, yep, totally. Do the work for me. I have a lot of things I have to do. I can't be reading all these books. (laughs) Yeah. My my favorite podcast as a tween was called The Best Damn Podcast Ever. It was the only thing I listened to. I had an iPod Shuffle that was full of episodes of this podcast that I would listen to on Shuffle. And I was <laughs> on it once because they had a segment called Battle where they would you'd sign up and they'd call you at the start of their recording and issue you a challenge and then call you back at the end of their recording and see if you completed the challenge. Ooh. And mine was to create a, a Taco Bell smoothie. So they called me and I was the most excited I've ever been in my life at age 12 or whatever. And I went to my dad's office and explained what this show was and that he had to drive me to Taco Bell. And I listened to that a lot because it was so thrilling to like hear me at the start and then like know during the rest of the episode. I was like, yeah. And then I was at Taco Bell and I was getting it done during this segment while they're just talking about games. What's the smoothie that you made? Yeah. What did it taste like? It was like a Crunchwrap Supreme and a taco, a general stuff that ended up looking very queso-y, like cheesy Ooh. color. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And good, actually, actually, it was not bad. Yeah. So you put it into um, like a blender, like, and, you know, don't rush past this, Leo. I yeah, want it. Yeah, I got to yeah. know. Did you keep the recipe? Yeah. Asking for a friend. Step by step instructions, please. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah>. The <laughs> photos no... are somewhere. There was a little pepper garnish my dad put on there. You have to like, remake Ooh. it either for a new show plus or for uh, the charity stream coming up. Ooh, oh, yeah. Yeah, you are obligated to do yeah. this now. All right. You know, Loved Taco it. Bell food is all about textures and like rearranging the same ingredients in different orders. So I bet it tasted fine. Like absolutely like everything from Taco Bell taste, which is to me, like a food that I could eat at any time of the day and any mood that I have. <laughs> like, yeah. It did yeah. not seem like Especially a stunt meal at all. Angry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my- I used to get Taco Bell exclusively right after therapy. <laughs> which yep. is and like, okay, that's an emotion and a time. <laughs> what a combo, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mine's so much dorkier and lighter, but there's an episode early on for Rebel FM, right, when that launched. Mm. Like, I was a big one-up fan, and when that imploded in, what, 2009, and then they launched Rebel FM and all that stuff. Um, but there's an episode early on that Jason Wilson, I think it was, who's like the editor-in-chief of Games Beat. I could be wrong, but I think that's what it was. Um, but he went on, and he just talked about writing and games writing and how to be a better writer. And it was the most soothing podcast i listen to it over and over and over again and the weird thing is and i'm still trying to work this through emotionally of what it means but the weird thing is he had a really he was really nervous to be on it and to be on this podcast talking about writing but somehow he had a really soothing voice 
despite clearly being terrified. Like at a certain point, it was like so uncomfortable. Remember Arthur Geese is like, uh, I, I need to get you water. Can, can I go get you a water? Like level of just kind of like mouth smack. So it, I, never before have I heard somebody that nervous on a podcast be also that soothing to listen to. And it was just a weird dynamic that I listened to again and again. That, uh, that reminds me of like, so I, was also, I was also really into one up way back in the day. Yeah. Um, that's why I got into doing all of this. And I remember the thing that made me decide to be a writer um, about games, which is that Dan Shu ran a blog post on one up back in the day where he basically point by point advised people not to be, not to go into writing about video games. Oh, interesting. He was like, you will not get paid well. Um, and also like, this will take a thing that you is a passion for you. That is a hobby for you and turn it fundamentally and irrevo- irrevocably into a job and you will never be the same. And I was like, you know, at the time I was like 17 or something. And I was like, yeah, but I'm different and better. So <laughs> I do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, a great Kieran Gillen blog post that, that amounts to this where he's just like, oh, by the way, if you work in games journalism, you are being taken advantage of. You have absolutely the ability to do anything else. And those skills that you have are valued outside of this industry. And I was like, well, what if I was just better than you? I'm not. <laughs> he's fucking <laughs> good. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hey, that ties in well to Steve Lucian's question. They say, if you could give your younger self about to embark on the career you're in now some advice, what would it be? Turn Don't around. Go back. Just because you're broke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Mm. Nathan, would you really say don't do it? Um, I don't know if I would say don't do it, but like, because no, I mean, I've, ha- I've had a really wonderful and incredible career. I think this would be more advice for anybody else aside from me. I think that I was very fortunate. I had the means to kind of like, stick it out until I made it basically. I, I think that that's, you know, the case for a lot of people who made it, not everybody by any means, but I think that a lot of people in this space, you know, were yeah. afforded the time and space and the means, you know, probably by way of their parents to like make it this far. Yeah. Um, Cause it is a very small field. There are not many positions. It's shrinking by the year. Like, you know, um, well, I mean, so remarkable when we launched aftermath we immediately started getting emails from people asking to freelance and then also so from fans people. of other writers just being like this person's free right now i'm a big yeah. fan of theirs we would love to scoop up everyone and save them all but like it really feels like it feels like musical chairs there's just no openings anywhere like it's yeah it's rough i feel like the advice i would have is just like you have you got to be stubborn as hell you have to demand that you you have to demand to take up space Especially if you're not white, not straight, not cis, any you know, like any of those things, not a not a man, you will not be taken as seriously. I, I guess I wish I could have told myself that even though like the highs are really high, the lows can also be really low. Mm. And you have to remember what actually matters, which is the work and the work for your audience. Yeah. Well, and also conversely, you know, you're talking about the idea of people getting taken advantage of. Like yeah, I think another really good piece of advice is don't let people take advantage of you because this is a yeah. field where it's really easy for that to happen. You know, yeah, fundamentally, absolutely. like you get to write about games for potentially a living. And so yeah, people can hold that over your head. Don't let anyone tell you that's a privilege, right? Like, yeah. don't let anyone it's a tell job. you it's work. It's always a job. If you are playing a game yep. until three in the morning, you deserve to get comped hours for the next day. Yep. You know, like it's it it is a job. Even though there are like hundreds of people that would happily take your spot, you are still performing labor. And you should be compensated for that. Yep. Bingo. Yeah. Very easy to, to be taken advantage of. I feel like what I would tell myself is about like not burning out when it feels in that first year at Game Informer, got yeah. landed the dream job, felt impossible that I would ever burn out on any of it. And to yeah. Hanson's credit, starting under him, he very explicitly was like, don't give yourself to this too much. Don't overdo it. You know, and, and of course, exactly like you're saying. But I'm built different. Nobody loves me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe for me, it'll be different. Yeah. 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 The folly of youth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's, um, again, too simplistic, but like, uh, this is a very specific thing. But I, I think of just like, I was making so many videos and I wish I had more of a bucket to put the videos in. You know what I mean? I feel like it, it's a simple, I guess, branding message, which feels like counterintuitive to everybody's deep, insightful points here. <laughs> you know, but it's a matter of like, I don't know, I'd visit all these Game Informer studio, or sorry, uh, video game studios with Game Informer uh, and make a bunch of random videos with developers, yada, yada, yada. But like, I should have been earlier on more specific about like, okay, 
we're going to a studio. We're going to make one of five different shows with the developers for which one would work better. And eventually we got into that groove with like the rapid fire interviews. And that was like our most successful interview series. And it's like, I should have just done that earlier for a bunch of different options, a bunch of different studios. Like, okay, these are our shows and we're bringing our shows to the game studios and rotating through the best options instead of just, here's an interview on the sound design of Battlefield 3. It's like, uh, sure, maybe some people will click on that, you know, yeah. but it's not going to blow up the charts. No, but you're totally right. The like some of the things that are unglamorous. Like I wish I also could have told myself one: you are the product. Like you, you have to always be marketing yourself at all times. Right. Yeah. But like also some of these unglamorous like branding related things. There's stuff that we now, as as you know, Nathan and I run our own company, we have to think about literally every day. Right. And you should take it seriously. It is a matter of life and death, actually. Mm -hmm. Even though it doesn't feel that way, because it's it's how you earn your money. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is gross, but I. I do agree, like on that branding thing too. Like, oh, I should have branded myself something earlier and cleaner. Like, yeah, just to, which yeah. which uh, the the blank gamer? Which one would you? Yes, be? <laughs> oh yes, really going back to the game before era. Yeah, for sure. Um, Please say yeah. raging, a manic depressive gamer. Oh <laughs> Literally, the, the, my, my husband has this bit where he calls himself the the nude gamer. He oh, claims to be, and he's like, I mean, but I only stream my hands, so nobody knows that. I, I, but everyone knows that I'm nude. Like, that's so funny. You know, um, when when is he starting an OnlyFans? <laughs> yeah, that's oh a great bit. Only the only hands is also only hands. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh my you god. You never know. It sells itself. You never know where it's gonna go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's not really career specific in a sense, but just like saving my money more and being better about my money. Mm. Like, and, and again, it's kind of like advice to yourself, but advice to everybody, like, because it is a, not that glamorous of an industry financially. Generally it's like, besides, yeah, you want to try to earn more and, and make more and have like a better life generally, but also things can, the advice I give anyone in any field, the second you get a job is start saving to leave it or have it leave you. It doesn't mm. even matter what field it is because mm. you don't, it sucks being in positions where you feel stuck. And I think, yeah. especially in our industry, I I think the advice I'd give myself is like, don't let anyone convince you that you don't have choices or that like you have, that, that life can't get any better than it is kind of thing. I think there are so many, so few like key outlets when you think of like a dream job in games media, you're probably only thinking of like five or six outlets or maybe starting your own thing. I don't know, maybe yeah. some people at this point are dreaming of being part of min max or aftermath and that's it's cool own era that we're entering into but ultimately i think a lot of times people will use the state of the world and the state of the industry to justify the oppression you feel or things you're unhappy with like besides what yeah. gita mentioned with don't let people don't let yourself talk yourself into saying that like oh well i'm like lucky i'm here so like i shouldn't complain like that is what allows all the bad stuff to continue. Like you'll keep getting underpaid because they'll tell you, oh, that's just how it is. Everyone underpays, everyone explo everyone's mm -hmm, doing this. Mm -hmm. But that's not entirely true. And it, it unfortunately is true in a lot of spaces, but like, it doesn't have to be the truth. It doesn't have to be the truth for you. And it's better to have a few ye good years that like, okay, maybe it doesn't feel as stable than to like buy into stability that doesn't even exist because a lot yeah. of these companies will tell you, mm -hmm. oh no, you have to, it has to be this way, <laughs> but don't worry. Cause like you're here, but also you're here unless like the company that owns us says that you're not, but like they mm -hmm. won't, yeah. but like yeah. they might, oh, you know, you it's the, like, I'm yeah, sorry. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you the apex of this example. I was at the Washington post yeah. and I, when I got my job oh, yeah. there, they were like, you know, we hire good reporters, not just like people who are good about knowing their own like domain or specialty. And so like if, you know, God forbid we ever close launcher, which was the name of the video game vertical that I was a part of, then, you know, we'll have a job for you elsewhere. You'll just report on something else. You'll be fine. Um, and, you did know, that happen they, they, to you, Nathan? That did not happen to me. <laughs> yeah. Instead, I got laid off earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they were telling me I was getting laid off, I was like, I specifically remember you telling me this when I asked what would happen if launcher folded. And they were like, sorry about it. Yeah, yeah. No, I got laid yeah. off from Vice in an airport and that was incredibly sick. And it was in the middle of a lot of long term projects that Vice had told me that they would totally support. And, yeah. you know, instead of doing that, uh, a lot of the C-suite gave themselves bonuses that were higher than my entire salary than I'd ever been paid in total from Vice. So, yeah. like, your job's not going to love you back. Like, you yeah. might love your job, but a job can't love you. Like, there is ultimately, if you work for a company that has like a, a an executive suite, those people are looking to pay people back on their investments more than they are hoping for your success. They want your loyalty, but you have to be loyal to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah. want your loyalty and then layoffs will happen and they'll go, damn, 
Did you see those layoffs happen? That was so crazy. How'd those happen? That was wild. I yeah. wonder why that happened. Yeah. 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 Advice to young me. Unionize. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah. the best thing you can do if you're working in an ununionized workplace right now is unionize. Like, Joe, uh, President Joe Brandon is, I've got beef with him on a lot of different things, but he has made the National Labor Review yeah. Board very There's powerful. No is good. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to unionize, now is the best time. Like, just take an example from people unionizing in Starbucks, people unionizing in McDonald's, people unionizing in the video game industry for the first time ever. Like, you deserve to be able to collectively bargain with your boss. That's mm-hmm. don't tell. Don't let them lie to you. Just take matters into your own hands. OK, Janet, let's do it. Yeah, it's about yeah. overthrow, overthrow your boss. <laughs> know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> sure, take it. It's don't yours. don't slack me it though, Leo, because we all know that like that's not a safe a safe space no. for any yeah, oh, uh, yeah. communications. That's what slack yes. stands for. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pin an anti-unionization message in the Slack channel in general. Everyone can check it out. It'll be really cool. Yeah, everyone join (laughs) hashtag unionize. (laughs) (laughs) JT writes in and says, hello, Janet and the gang. I don't know about framing things that way. Um, Let's play a game where we start (laughs) with the most recent year and take turns naming a different game released in that year. Then we go back a year and do the same and just keep going forever. Scary. If you can't name a game or get it wrong, you're out. The last person Mm. standing wins. Okay, so no Googling, obviously. Oh, fuck. <laughs> like, Janet? Don't remember Man, anything don't like that happened this. any year. I know, right? right? Uh, okay, and so for the order, let's go off the Discord order. So, Gita, you can start, then me. I assume it's the same for everybody there. That'll be easier than calling on people. So starting 2023, just name a game that released this year. Army Core 6. Love it. I'm going to go with Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Lies with P. This feels too easy. This is the only year we're going to have a lot of answers for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Holders Gate 3. Um, let's see. What's another game that came out this year? Oh, oh no. I'm like answering trivia fumble. questions because I got blank him. immediately. We got him. We got him. I'm so the same. good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dredge. Love it. Go. How about, let's do it snake, uh, what's it called? Snake order oh, or whatever. Okay. So for now, 2022, yeah. so you can go first, Nathan, to make it fair. Um, let's see. 2022 was the year of other games that exist. <laughs> Right. That I know of. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt it is that. There's no doubt it is that. Video yeah. games did exist in 2022. That That's one thing I know for sure. Which video games? What did I, video games? What did I, what did <laughs> I do <laughs> yesterday? What did this I is do horrible. <laughs> I hate this game. I'm going to go on record as saying okay. this game was made you specifically can, to thwart me. You can, you can forfeit if you need to for this round. Or, um, or forever. Because well, my brain wants to say that Xenoblade did, but that's not right. Is it, it is. Yes. Xenoblade Chronicles oh, 3. Okay. Yep. Xenoblade yeah, Chronicles 3. Oh, oh, you got it. You there got we it. go. Leo? That's Snake Order? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, 2022 we're doing? Yeah. Wow, not so it's easy. So painful. Oh, that's, <laughs> I'm in the box. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Last wow. year, wow, incredible! Wow. It, we're video games, the land of contrast. Are you are you bound out, uh, Leo? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> really, I love that. Okay, Janet. Okay, uh, nobody saves the world. Love it. Gotta wear Ragnarok. That's Elden the, that was it. Ring. There we go. Sure. Elden Ring, of course. Oh, yeah. Duh. Okay, Gita, 2021. 2021. It's going to be so hard for me. <laughs> Take it oh, away. Mom's sweaty right. mom's spaghetti. Oh, Take God. it away. I'm going to, I'm making a guess here. And okay. it's an it's an expansion, but it's for an MMO, which I think counts as a new game. But did Shadowbreakers come out in 2021? Chat, you got to let us know. Backstage passers, did Shadowbreakers, if that feels right. Am I wrong? Okay. I feel like that's right. I feel like I could go backward in time with Final Fantasy XIV expansions and be pretty much okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, let us know. Oh, uh, man, someone said 2019. <laughs> is it 2019? <laughs> I'm right, losing. Me, I lost. Oh, wow. Yeah, July okay. no, 2019. I was so off. All right, Janet. I'm yeah, taking yeah. I'm taking the easy one. Chicory, a colorful tale. Oh, you. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, my God. Literally. Li- <laughs> literally, I wrote that down. I don't know if it'll ever gotcha, go. Gotcha, gotcha. It won't because of the lighting. It's in there. And I wrote 2021 next to it. Okay. Um, I want to say. I want to say. Life is Strange, True Colors. I think it came out that year. I think you're right. I think that sounds right. That sounds right. I'll double check it. All right, Nathan, 2021. Okay, 2021. Um, Wait, I've got to like do some time and place stuff in my brain here. No, that game came out in 2022. Crap. 
Um, I, I'd like to be in just for the years where a Hitman game come out because I'll because I'll oh okay great that. So I'll say Hitman. Hey, 3. The weird oh, thing no, is it, 2018. when we hit 2020, I have like 12 games I remember coming out that year. Not the I question, Nathan. Not the question. Inside. 2021. What do you got? 2021. What if no games came out that year? <laughs> Great question. Five, That's right. Four, three, two. Nathan, uh, you have to sacrifice. Come on. I, one. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Well, in my brain, I was like, neon white? No, 2022. Oh, Weird West, sorry. also 2022. All right. right. Okay, that's fine. Down to Janet and I. This is the way it has to go. I'm sorry. All right, 2020. Uh, so Snake Order would be Easy you first, year. Janet. Okay, so it's me first? Yep. Snake Order. Um, The Last of Us 2. I'm sorry, you didn't say part two. You were, no. Uh, uh, let's well, go okay. with Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, yeah. Okay, then 2019. Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. Control. Nice. Uh, okay. Yep. Okay. Twenty eighteen, Janet. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! It's me again. The snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The uh, snake. The snake will get you. Solid snake. Man. Order. Oh my god! So many games rang through my mind. It's tough to pick a favorite. Good problem to have, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hitman Two. Final Fantasy Seven Remake. No, I just nope. That was no, that was twenty twenty. <laughs> Oh shoot! All right, I'm, right. Out. I'm just out. I'm just out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is 28. Uh, God of War. 18. <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. God there of it War. is. There it was. Yeah. That, that is a lot harder. If you're doing it at home, don't yell at us. It's hard to be on the spot. You come on this yeah. show. We dare you and do yeah. it. Also, the two of you are good at remembering when things happened. Thank I you. I have ADHD. That is my excuse. Okay, this it goes in. You tell me where the bathroom is, and I will not remember what you said to me. Okay, well, <laughs> it's the, in 2016. How many times the, have the to tell you? The weird thing is, I can do the opposite. If you name a game, I can pretty reliably say which year it came out. Persona right? Five. Yeah, if I have to name out. game based on a year, then I'm like, I are there years? Yes. Are there games? No, They're I'm totally with concepts. you. Yeah. We made them up. Uh, yeah. The worst is when you ask me what my favorite of anything is if I haven't had any time to think of. You say like, uh, well, "What's your favorite movie?" and I'll be like, "I don't know what a movie is." Yeah. Like, I'm sorry to cut happened? you. Can yeah. you explain what a movie is. I don't want to. There was you exactly out, but... one thought going through my head, which was, "How do I not have the spotlight on me?" Right now? <laughs> there are no games coming up from any year. Right. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to remember that game that you like the games that are like the U games of the two tens. Yes. Like I'm like, when did Rumbleverse come out? Like we talked. That about was 2022. That. Like, I went right. into the years for two tens, but also like I make a top ten list on Pennant Pixels as well. Mm -hmm. And then like slightly like I'm like where where was I? And then like what was I playing? Like mm -hmm. where was I working? Like what was go but yeah, 2018. Hey, you know what? Know, we let's all hold our head up high. We didn't embarrass ourselves in this podcast. We all did great. And now, Gita, it's time go. for the ultimate question. What is your favorite question of the week? If you had to choose one. Honestly, the Mona Lisa question I thought was amazing. Ooh. <laughs> I love that question. I like it too. I, hmm. I feel really passionately about art, and I, I'm not sure what the question asker wanted to hear, but it allowed me to talk about something that I care a lot about, which is the pres art preservation okay. and like the value of art in life and also uh, the trolley problem, which is one of my favorite hypotheticals. It's my well, also, um, that, that person is in chat right now. And they mentioned that they add, that they also added another question to the question, <laughs> Nathan, which it was is, too depressing. How many I can't. dog lives would you sacrifice for yeah. the Mona Lisa? How many dogs I would you sacrifice? I would shoot the Mona Lisa personally if it came to the, yeah. between that and a dog. Like, I was going to say, I'd sacrifice humans to save a dog. Yeah, I didn't want to bum everybody <laughs> out by bringing up the whole dog part of it. Um, okay, so Gita wants dog murder for question of the week. Um, mm -hmm. There's also, yeah, I, I love the best game name of 2023 i think that's good indie question i like the career advice but nathan where are you leaning on this one yeah let's see let's say probably the career advice one. Ooh. i i you know that one was a fun one to answer and it generated a lot of like real you know insightful discussion not there just insightful go. but like you know corporate ire heartfelt <laughs> discussion okay. i think right. and I, I enjoyed that janet and leo break that tie i go with gita's answer okay yeah. Yeah, Mona Lisa. All right, Mona Lisa, there we go. Yeah. Men Stand adore you, Chandler. Down. And you just won the prize from I Am 8-Bit. Congratulations, you got a physical copy of the Artful Escape on Nintendo Switch. Uh, and now it's time to play a jingle that you won't be able to hear, but everybody else will, I promise, called Get a Load of This. Yeah. 
All right, guests of honor. You don't have to go first or anything, but this is where we share a little tidbit, something that stood out to us, and there's links below for all these fun things from everybody. Um, hey, everybody, uh, get a load of this. Um, Jack Black's mom. Y'all heard about this? Her name is Judith Love Cohen, and she helped, she worked for NASA, and she helped create the abort guidance system, which saved the astronauts on Apollo 13. <laughs> Jack Black's mom. Huh. Jack Black's mom. Yeah. And there's like a bunch that, of stories a while Jack ago. Black. That Jack Black. That Jack Black. But he was going Jackie around Black. a big way. And then uh, the story about like, you know, her saving the lives I of the astronauts in Apollo 13. And then actually. Jack Black, he he sent an Instagram post where he's like, yeah, it's true. My mom was a badass aerospace engineer and also a loving mother. So that's Yeah. Cool. I think, I, but didn't he make some appearance at NASA like within the last year or so? People were like, why? And he was like, because it's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know Judith question. Love Why Cohen? are you here? Come on. Jack Black, why? <laughs> uh, let's see. Janet, you got one? Yeah, get a lot of this. Uh, again, might be common knowledge to other people, but uh, it wasn't to me. I've gotten into you know vinyl semi-recently, and I saw um, this really cool portable Bluetooth turntable. It's ridiculously tiny. It's called the, um, it's from, I mean, I'm sure other people make it, but Audio Technica is, is the oh. hamburger. I like love audio. We have an Audio Technica turntable also. Nice. And, yeah. You know, they have really high quality turntables. I think I'm I'm interested in this. We have one that is like four sitting stationary in our home. My yes. husband David has. So we have two enormous Tupperware like like things full of records, and then another enormous pile of records because every time he goes to a show, he just buys a record, and. Uh, Audio Technica makes great stuff, but I'm super interested in the idea of a portable turntable. Yeah. So what, uh, what table do you have, if you know offhand? Oh, God. We have the one that was recommended by Wirecutter. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel you. I was out here like, hey, someone tell me what to buy that isn't that hard to use. And I, I have yeah. the um, the LP120, which is like mm -hmm. one step above like the cheaper starter of the mm -hmm, 60. But mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've loved it. Also a big fan of Audio Technica. Um, yeah, this is like... It it's called the official name is the ATSB 2022. It's a little sound burger, and it's had, had 60th anniversary. I guess they kind of did like a oh, cool another. It's not a print because it's a device, but you know another run of it, and it's, it looks awesome. It's like a little it's priced very fairly for the kind of technology it is too. It's 200 yeah. bucks for this, which is a pretty good price. And it's wow. just like bonkers to picture. Like I don't know. It's so funny because vinyl is so cumbersome. So the idea of like now on the go but it's like still kind of cumbersome like i think there's yeah. something really fun about that and i like i don't know i feel like the whole point for me with vinyl is to just have fun with like your music collection i feel like this combined with oh my god the the press pictures they have for this are just gorgeous it's like the table next to a bunch of like fast food like american yeah. style hamburgers like it's just the art direction on it the aesthetic it's a very vibey device so it uh, feels yeah, it like a, a vision from the 1970s when we yes. thought technology would look a lot cooler than it does now you know? <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. It, it, it's a really that, that looks really sick <laughs> so uh, links below for all this stuff uh, nathan you got some um this is something that like i wanted to include in my piece about five nights at freddy's the movie but i couldn't really find room for it um, so leading up to the release of that movie, there was this whole little war between Five Nights at Freddy's and Chuck E. Cheese. It was mainly one sided. Uh, Chuck E. Cheese was trying to both profit off of the success of the movie and also not in any way acknowledge that Five Nights at Freddy's exists. Oh, interesting. Yes. <laughs> um, so they had this promotion called Five Nights of Fun. Um, which, you know, already that's like, can you even do that? Are you going to get sued <laughs> by the thing that you inspired? Yeah. Um, and so like they did this promotion and they had a little advisory that they gave to employees with it about what they could and couldn't say. Yes. Um, yeah. And so let's see. Um, let's see. So important note, our engagement is not a formal relationship or partnership with the movie. Our brand is naturally being woven into discussions due to the nature of the subject <laughs> material. If they're going to mention us, let's give them something to talk about more than what they've been saying. So like they have this little things like say this, not this. So it's like, we're all about fun. So we thought like, say this is like, we're all about fun. So we thought we'd think of a way to have five nights of it in a row. Um, <laughs> rather than together with the five nights at Freddy's movie, we are doing a promotion. Things like that, where it's like, Perfect. we can't acknowledge this movie. We've got to make it all about Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> we feel um, like six nights would be too much. Right, right. <laughs> and then like all the way down to five nights of fun is not 
related to or in partnership with any company, brand, organization, or media outlet outside of Chuck E. Cheese. This is a direct quote, by the way. Employees are supposed to say that with their human mouths. Like it's, it's written it's on their hand as they're looking say. up to the person and looking them in the eyes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Leo. And apparently, I guess they started like blocking people on social media who oh made God. comparisons between this and Chuck E. Cheese. Sure. Like, I mean, oh, yeah, they, they, yep. Absolutely incredible. I you love brands. You only live once. I mean, you got to do it. It just, it's fun. Um, Leo, you going? Get a load of this Waffle House training video I found. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Similarly, uh, it's instructions for employees on what's called the pull drop mark order calling method. And it seems like the biggest waste of everyone's time and energy. It makes you have so much empathy for Waffle House employees. Having to learn what they... This is essentially a secret code where it's like if to indicate to the chef of what goes on each plate, you have a mayonnaise packet on the right side, which means two pancakes and a cheese sli <laughs> slice put at no. 45 degrees to indicate one egg. Ridiculous, crazy stuff. I, it'll make it into a video I make someday. Oh, that's perfect. I love it. Gita, you gone? Okay, so this came up uh, because David, my, my husband, and I talk about this all the time. So uh, the leftist thinker responsible for the uh, really, truly groundbreaking book, The Shock Doctrine, who has been an outspoken critic of the Bush administration and American hege cultural hegemony for a very long time, Naomi Klein, has come out with a book called Doppelganger. And the book is all about how everyone it mixes her up with uh, right-wing grifter Naomi Wolf. And I've been thinking about this a lot because my, my husband's name is David Grossman, and he frequently gets interviewed requests for the acclaimed Israeli author David Grossman mm. and it's gotten to the point where he's like gotten uh, to the Zoom call and opened <laughs> up the call and they realized he's just like a 30 something guy from Brooklyn and not the acclaimed Israeli author that's been like nominated <laughs> for the Nobel Prize Whoa. Um, I think that's such a sure her Naomi Klein is such an incredible writer that she manages to create an entire wonderful book out of something that it is basically just a post <laughs> like it, she includes a quote from a tweet on how to tell the difference between naomi klein and naomi wolf in the book and it's <laughs> if naomi be klein you're doing fine but if naomi be wolf oof baby oof <laughs> <laughs> that's really good uh, we have a whole channel in the discord for min max uh, patreon supporters where you can share get a little of this it's the greatest news feed on the internet other than Aftermath. Um, but if you go in there, uh, Forrest with two R's shared a tweet from January 2010 where somebody tweeted, since I could never even hope to have a chance to direct it, the next big mocap Avatar-like movie should be The Legend of Zelda. And that was a tweet from Wes Ball, who was recently announced to be directing the live-action Legend of Zelda. Okay, uh, I'm suddenly very excited for this. Yeah, yeah right. Isn't it weird? Interesting. I love that. I love people accidentally calling their shots. Uh, oh, did you see Hunter Schaefer also uh, is now because someone on Twitter, Hunter Schaefer is an actress who's been in Euphoria, and she has yeah. a very elfin appearance. Someone on Twitter said she should play Zelda, and now she is like made an Instagram post being like, "Cast me as Zelda." Oh God, yeah. perfect. Yeah, I love it. It's funny. I, mean, I ran into her in, in the line for a party that I didn't even go to recently because um, it was like wow. a, it was like a, a club in my general area celebrating like their 10th birthday or something so like a lot of people showed up for it and me and some friends decided to go there on a whim and like the line is just way too long we we're like no it's not worth it and then one of my friends was like is that hunter schaefer and it was and we <laughs> said we nothing to her and left that's my story uh, Perfect. New York, baby. <laughs> that's it concrete jungle where dreams are made of <laughs> yeah uh they nathan gita thanks for joining us I love to be on the show. Please have yeah, me again. Super fun. so much fun. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank yeah. you. Uh, if people enjoy you and want to help support an independent site uh, that's clean to read like Aftermath, where should they go? Aftermath.site. Aftermath. Aftermath. Oh. Aftermath. Smart. Aftermath. Smart. Smart. smart, smart, smart. One more time. Aftermath.site. And they can find a place to support it directly other than just click on it. There's a big old subscribe slash. button. Yeah. If you go it's to Aftermath. the top of the screen. And if also, if you just want to type something, aftermath.site yeah. slash products. Sweet. That's yes. link. There yes. we go. The ultimate product. Awesome. And we also have like a tip jar that you can donate any amount of money to. You could give us $1 billion. Um, you could buy our silence. Like if you gave us that much, we would I've probably thought just about stop. how much. I've actually yeah. thought about listing that as a joke somewhere on oh. what yeah. I offer as well. Buying yeah. my yeah. silence. 
for a, a yearly salary of at least one hundred thousand dollars, I will stop. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, you, cut should, it out. you should put it higher than that. Yeah. Really? Uh, give me, I need at least a quarter million. Like. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Pay me like an executive. Pay me like one of your French executive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can y'all make a product that says that also, since it's slash now product, we have to, which implies you know, the existence of multiple products. It's True. in the pipeline. I've okay. always, I've been saying to Luke that our, our logo would look super good on a dad hat. So yeah. mm. I, I we hope to, once we get things more settled, to have this kind of thing available for y'all. Yeah. Sweet. We're going to have some moich. Love it. Uh, check out Aftermath. Everybody helps support independent games media there. Uh, thank you so much for being on this show. And thank you so much to everybody else for watching or listening to this big old episode. Uh, a lot of things to plug here at MinMax. Uh, we have a really busy span of time. Uh, Trivia Tower, first things first, coming up Tuesday, November 21st. If you support MinMax on Patreon at any tier, even that $2 tier, you can compete in game trivia this Tuesday, the 21st at 7 p.m. Central. And you can win a code for Metal Gear Solid Master Collection on any platform you want. Want on uh, a code for Teardown, which is now available on consoles. You can win a code for that. Last person standing wins Astro A30 headset and a bunch more. Um, also, if you want more conversation about Spider-Man 2, uh, you can check out our big episode of Max Spoilers, where Janet and Jacob Geller and Kyle and I um, we all unpacked our favorite moments from Spider-Man 2. It's available on MinMax's YouTube channel. It's also in the bonus podcast feed. Also in that bonus podcast feed is Party Chat, our weekly bonus podcast. Uh, we're slightly reworking it a little bit, and I think this week's episode is a really good example of that, where it was Halo, uh, Halo, Haley and uh, Leo Haley and I. I. Uh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Hell yeah. But Haley McLean and Leo Vader and I, um, I think it's the best episode of Party Chat we've ever done, Leo. If really? I may. I, I really love that episode. Yeah, it's a lot. Maybe it's just because it felt like a therapy session for me of just talking about work-life balance and you know stresses internally the right level of content to keep everybody involved with MinMax happy all that good stuff but I felt like it was a very that was exactly the conversation we would have over lunch and I feel good about that you know totally yeah I'm really proud of it too um, and then also we did a live reaction to the Garfield trailer on there and broke down the game of the year nominations and stuff like that or the overall uh, game awards nominations uh, also this week Janet and I for new show plus uh, you all voted for it so I had a piano recital in VR so if you want to see that piano vision game in the meta quest 3 that I talked about recently on the podcast I think last week's episode you can see it on MinMax's YouTube channel check that out also thanks for your support on Twitch for all those subs we hit our goals we're going to be making new show overflow a one episode one-off where we're reviving a, an idea that was rejected for new show plus by the community but we still think is a good idea so that should be coming up this week leo if you're still feeling good about it yeah okay tomorrow, right Sweet. yeah yeah it's gonna be a blast that'll be up uh, on our youtube channel as well after it airs on twitch uh, also we're doing our big thanksgiving jokes that's gonna be happening next week where myself and leo and jeff mark and jeff cork will be telling jokes for why we're thankful for gaming this year so look forward to that on the next youtube I channel next week got a killer lies of p1 lined up i it's can't cool. wait does it involve the p organ or are you above that I'm above that. Yeah, hell yeah. Above the waist yeah. lies a P jokes. So you can look forward to that. <laughs> uh, we also obviously have the deepest dive on Alan Wake 2, the middle chunk of that game that just went live on MinMax's YouTube channel. And again, in that bonus podcast feed for Patreon supporters, uh, we, we unpack the chapter in that game that it seems like everyone is in love with um, and a bunch of other stuff. It's everything in that game up through chapter six. It's a, it's a super fun discussion. Like uh, the deepest dive in Alan Wake 2, Leo, we talked about it last time as well on the podcast, but one of my favorite so far it's it's been a blast yeah definitely my favorite i've been on yeah it's it's really good uh also we have an interview that went live on minmax's youtube channel and again that bonus podcast feed with which is with the founders of second wind who left uh, the escapist yahtzee and uh, nick and all those folks uh talking about leaving the escapist again to form an independent media company so you can check that out on our youtube channel and in the bonus podcast feed and coming up on Monday, we have another interview going live. And this is a group interview, and it's with the developers of The Simpsons Hit and Run. It's an oral history oh, wow. of The Simpsons Hit and Run with that a big group of... That's yeah. exactly the point. Yeah, so we talk all about it. Um, and that interview it is happening because of Jawar Hello, a MinMax Patreon supporter, who chose The Simpsons Hit and Run to be declared the game champion of, and that was the game that won the game championship. So that right. whole oral history of The Simpsons Hit and Run is directly 
specifically because of your support overall from all Patreon supporters and specifically from Dwar Hello joining the Game Champion tier. If you think any of that content is worth $2, all we ask is you go to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends, jump in there, help support independent games media. We appreciate it. And if you don't want to do that, the least you could do is go to Aftermath and help support them over there. Uh, but hey, that is it for this episode of the podcast. We can't thank you all enough, uh, but we will thank you a little bit more because of the folks at the Game Champion tier who we haven't mentioned yet. Malcolm Holiday is the champion of Peglin. Uh, Clemens Zobel is the champion of Stranglehold, of course. And Zachary nice. Pliggy is the champion of Superman 64. Thanks for choosing some good stuff, folks. All right, Nathan, Gita, Janet, Leo, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Can't say thank you enough for making this whole thing happen, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much, everybody. Be good, have fun, let's go. Let's go.